91.3 FM WBNY Buffalo would like to present Week of the Warriors from 10 p.m. Sunday, March 22nd. We will be having DJs go 24 hours straight for an entire week. That's seven days to help raise awareness against domestic violence. There will be a ton of interviews, including Glorified Thursday, which will be a day full of bands coming in and playing over the air, just like our glorified rehearsals on the local show. Kicking it off Wednesday night at 10 p.m. with Legion Reed and the Sleepy Hahas. Join us for the Week of the Warriors here on 91.3 FM WBNY Buffalo. Good morning. It is Wednesday. It's March 25th, 2015, Week of the Warriors Day 3. Week of the Warriors is a week-long event conducted during our Buffalo State Spring Break to bring awareness to domestic violence. We are here with Kayla. She is the third DJ to do this 24-hour marathon. She is interviewing Catholic Charities. And so um, so we make use of our fellow uh, uh, warriors, let's call them, in the context of your... Um, of your series, um, and so we we never assume that we have all the answers, um, and we make those connections. So wh- if it's up in Tonawanda and we're in Erie County, we will do so. Um, if it was in uh, Olean, we would uh, find resources, and we work closely with whomever is the designated domestic violence um, shelter or agency in that area. Okay. Um, well, and I'm really liking what I'm hearing, and I, I'm, I'm just, I, I'm blown away that I didn't know the Catholic Charities helped domestic violence when I was going through it, or even like afterward when I started seeking help, because I'm from Niagara County, Lockport area, and I literally like, I had heard about Family Justice Center um, around the time that um, I had just left, and we, I went to the legal aid there, and. I was told that the Family Justice Center couldn't help me because I was in the Niagara County and that county line was my barricade. And the biggest problem, and you had just talked about the ACES study, and I know I have never heard of that, but at the same time, I remember when I was pregnant, somewhere in between, so I probably had another six to eight months where I was still the victim. Um, My mom had asked me to come over and my sister met and I didn't know she was coming over and I didn't think anything of it because I'm very close with my family. That was one of the biggest things that my abuser couldn't stand was how close and he couldn't break that. He couldn't isolate me because I continued to talk to my family. So they came over and um, without me knowing, my mom had started this um, and I can't remember what the movie was, but the movie, it was talking about what you were just saying, the trauma in those first couple of years. And it even went farther and stemmed farther back because it was talking about if you're going through trauma while you're um, while the mother is pregnant, that baby is still hearing things, and you can hear so you can see signs and in studies years later of them saying something that they heard, and there was no way that they could possibly have heard it. I remember repeating back um, a fight between my mother and father because that's where the domestic violence started in my family, and it went back into their generations. But I remember repeating back to my mother a story about a fight that they got into and it wasn't that big but she had thrown like a whole pitcher of kool-aid right right in his face and i don't remember what happened or what possessed them to go through whatever fight but i like i was in her she was pregnant with me during that fight and she's like there is no possible way that you even have any recollection of that fight and i'm just like well i remember it like i was there wow wow that's very powerful and and um and you were there yes I was. I was in her womb. Yeah. Wow, that's amazing. Well, it and for your mom and your sister to come to you, um, you know, there in some areas uh, the shelters are called, like my sister's place, my cousins, uh, mi casa, um, because of the fact that we that support systems are there, but sometimes our natural support systems. Uh, if, as you say, this man was trying to cut you off from your natural support system, uh, if he had been successful, you would have been cut off from your mother, from your sister, and from that support that you needed. As many of the women are in our group uh, are cut off or have been cut off uh, from that, and and we cover that in, in part of the classes. Uh, Who are your support systems? You know, what is your safety plan? We go over safety plan, power and control, because it's an uneven power relationship uh, that's cutting them off and is isolating them. 
um, and uh, that's that's one of the techniques that uh, offenders use. And another thing that I was getting at is I think the biggest memory for me, because my family, we are fighters to the core. Like I've always, like even through that, that whole time that I was a victim, I, do, I would never say that I was the standard victim because, and I, and I talked about this because I came in and talked about my experience on Monday at the end of the interview sessions. And I would never say that I was the standard victim because I fought and I fought and I, and I fought back and he, and I remember, and I, and I said this on Monday too, but he said that he said to me because we were fighting and he was just always like he broke my he broke the closet doors and he put like holes in the walls because he was throwing me and I was pregnant. He told me that fighting me when I was nine months pregnant was like fighting a man and he was trying to insult me. But I took that as like, yeah, I'm badass. <laughs> And it was just, and I remember like that was one of the biggest moments that I became empowered and it was in there and he empowered me because he gave me power. He, he transferred the power and control to me because he thought he was insulting me, but I took it as a compliment. And I remember, and it was in the middle of, um, the, um, relationship with him and like I was saying, my mother, uh, I went over to my mother's house and my sister came over and they had a plan that I had no a idea anything about and it ended up backfiring. But um, so I was over at my mom's and I'm sitting there and I'm talking and she plays this movie. And this is when we start talking about um, the fight that my mother and father were in. And I had not noticed, but my sister took my keys. And then a little while later, they ordered pizza oven because that was my favorite pizza. And I'm like, oh, this is fun. I'm hanging out with my family. I don't have my, my abuser's not around. We're having pizza. And my sister says, so how would you feel if we kidnapped you? And I'm like, what? I'm like, what? You're, what? She's like, so I have your keys and you're not getting them back and you're not going home because we don't think that it's a good environment for you and the baby, and um, you're not going back. And at that point, like, and I'm, I'm processing it, and I'm thinking about it, and, and like, I want to say 75% of me was all like, thank God somebody was willing to stand up. But then that other 25% means in a half hour I'm supposed to be on my way to pick up my abuser and the wrath that I'm going to get because I'm not going to be there, and how is he going to get home, and... Like, I started going into this, like, panic mode, and I shut down, and I stopped talking, and, like, that it's it just unwinded in my head, and the it was just, I was so excited that they were coming in, and they were trying to help me, but at the same time, the actual wrath that I was facing in my head for not picking him up, not being there, him having to find another ride, it just, like, flip-flopped, and I stopped talking, and I just burst into tears, and... Um, my sister left and she took the keys and I ended up, I, w I was pregnant, I was wearing all dark clothes, I just walked down the street, it was raining, I'm crying, and I refused to stay at my mom's house, I had a friend pick me up, um, I ended up getting back to my abuser, he had me try to press charges on my sister for stealing my car keys, and we never talked for a month straight, and me and my sister, we were very close, and it almost broke the relationship. Women know when it's safe to leave. And so we talk about the safety plans. Uh, so, you know, whatever we do, you have to do it when, you're, when it's safe to do so. So women who call in for help, we're asking, is it safe? For yourself, you needed to be involved in the safety plan to be successful. You wanted it, but it has to be something because you in your gut knew it, there were going to be repercussions you were going to have to face. The idea of a safety plan and how they were doing it is very noble, but the woman who is being the victim has to be part of the safety plan. It has to be her plan. She has to, she, and she knows deep in her, her gut um, what is safe and what is not safe. I, uh, I'm, I'm just, I'm in awe because you just put the words to it, and I'd like, I, I could never figure out what happened, and my sister, she was so upset, and I always get the feeling that she holds it against me because she tried to save me, and I went through so much more after that, and she, like, it was, but you just, you put it, if I ha if she had maybe involved me in the plan, maybe I could have, like, he was at work all day, maybe I could have just planned, and w we would have had it over that, but, like, it went over my head, and I just wasn't ready. Mm -hmm. Well, safety planning is so challenging, and sometimes people might even say, "Well, there, I don't. There's no way for me to stay safe." Um, I remember uh, a discussion about uh, a woman who lived in a rural area, and she was cut off 
There was no way that uh, anyone had contact with her. And so um, she had to come up with a safety plan where she informed the mailman, just a note to the mailman, if my light is on in the day, call the police. Because she was able to walk out to the mailbox, and that was the only choice she had. So the safety plan for each woman has to be different, and the circumstances are different. So um, your example is a perfect illustration that families want to rescue you, and then they kind of get mad that you didn't pay attention. But the truth is you need that knowledge that if you need them, they're there. And so, um, so you know, as, as Liz said, um, you weren't ready, and... Um, you reacted as many women would react. You knew the danger that you were living with. That, that, that's exactly it. I'm so happy that you guys came in today. Well, good to be here. And I want to give a huge thank you for coming out. Everybody's listening right now. This is Catholic Charities, and they are an option. They're everywhere, and they delegate you. If, if they can't physically help you, they will find help. Thank, thank you. you. Mm-hmm. Thanks very much. Any last words for you guys? or We appreciate this opportunity, and I'm in the Chicktawaga office, so uh, if they want to call there, the number is 681-7394, 681-7394, with domestic uh, violence questions, uh, interest in our support group. I'll be happy to talk to them. Okay, great. I also, um, being on campus, I want to remind everyone that... um, Dating violence occurs at almost a 40% rate, rate, so that um, we have to be very um, cautious of that as we're growing up, teens into 20s, um, because that is the be- that's where the seeds are sown and uh, the impact is felt uh, by women and men. Okay, thanks. We have actually somebody from Catholic Charities coming in later today from the abusers aspect. Mm-hmm. I'm really excited for that because I've always wanted to know like how that person handles the job. <laughs> uh-huh. Well, that our, that program is very interesting because it's um, it's a referral by the court. So the court is really the one who we were answering to. So that if the man does not follow through, the court holds them accountable. That, and yeah, that so needs to happen. Yes. Somebody has to hold these men, these these abusers accountable because they're not just men. They're men, women, and it doesn't matter shape, size, color, <laughs> sexuality. There's it, just everybody. Absolutely correct. All right. Well, thanks so thanks much. Thanks so much. Thank you for coming on. Again, you're listening to 91.3 WBNY. Uh, Kayla took a mini break, and oh, she is God. back to finish her 24-hour marathon. All right, guys, and uh, we're back with um, some interviewing, and uh, yeah. Jess, do you want to speak on this a little bit? Um, Okay. Well, this is an interview that came on. um, She actually scheduled this in really, like, this morning. So she said that she wanted to come on and speak and um, asked me if we still had any availability. So I ended up working this in, and... um, I'm excited to have this one. Um, sh- we're having more technical difficulties, but it's okay because DJ Pumpkin is here and he's gonna fix this. <laughs> okay, so um, again, uh, we're talking. This is Week of the Warriors. This is day three. Kayla is the third DJ. She's doing a 24-hour marathon. She actually came in uh, yesterday yeah, with I me. Can't hear through either of them. I hear you. Oh, here's off. <laughs> I didn't know it turned out wrong. <laughs> oh, sorry. That's what's going yeah. on over there, there in Studio go. B. <laughs> she actually came in yesterday with me. She woke up at 7 yesterday so that she would be available. We could hear all that. <laughs> so that she would be available. So she's been up yet since yesterday at 7 o'clock in the morning. But I guess we're only going to count 24 hours. <laughs> How you feeling? <laughs> um, I got my second wind at like 8 o'clock. So, you know... I. 
I feel alive again. <laughs> our, I've heard uh, a lot of mixed uh, feelings about our 15, 16, so. Yeah, yeah, that's definitely, definitely a hard one. And it's, it's fun for me. <laughs> I've been coming in every day from 10 to 6 throughout all these interviews, and I, like, I'm greeting people, and I'm signing people in and talking to people, and we tell them about their interview questions, and I thought that was going to be the easy job. <laughs> and now I'm running around trying to talk to everybody, make sure everybody's in the right places, and... But the funny part for me is I get to stand on the outside and just watch you guys. <laughs> I get to watch you guys and you guys just like, I watch the energy just melt away and I'm commenting it on Facebook and like yesterday, Evan, I would just watch him. He was so energetic and he was just yelling and screaming and he loved this song. He was blurring the music and then hour 15, 16, we started to see him less in the lounge. <laughs> He just yep. He started doing <laughs> jumping jacks and <laughs> running around to try and energize himself. Yesterday, Evan had a lava lamp and a candle. He was setting the mood. <laughs> I brought a candle in today. He so. wouldn't let us keep the lava lamp. Yeah, that was unfortunate. But we have a guest in um, Studio B, and she, I guess, there's no more technical difficulties. I can hear her <laughs> laughing. Yes. <laughs> Hello. Do you want to introduce yourself? Um... I don't even know how. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Guest uh, number two for Wednesday is uh, we're going to call her Betty. Betty. Oh, that's a that's a classy name. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> nice. I can see I can see Betty. I can see Betty. Really? Yeah. Huh. <laughs> <laughs> like, like maybe right. if you were like born in like the fifties. Yeah. You know, huh. growing up in the sixties, you could be a Betty. <laughs> I like, would have loved to have been a sixties child. There you go. Yeah. yeah. I think that you're thinking Betty Boop in your head right now. Maybe, yeah. Really? Because, <laughs> like, 50s, 60s, yeah. 70s, those are all the years that people were really talking about Betty Boop, and then she's looking at you like, I could see Betty. <laughs> is I Betty mean, Boop <laughs> Betty Boop is in Studio B? All right. <laughs> all right, uh, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Um. Well, I... I don't know. <laughs> I don't even know where to begin, actually. I've... Um, I've known Josh for quite a while, and uh, she asked me to come in and and talk a little bit about my history. So um, I don't even know where to start with this. I mean, there's so much that's gone on, and uh. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll start with um, have you you've have you ever experienced domestic violence? Yes, yes, I have. Um, yeah, I, I have quite a a history, um, and regretfully it started. Uh, when I was young, when I was in high school, uh, with my being raped in my uh, photography class of all places, um, I had a best friend who didn't, uh, who I had told, but you know she didn't really stand up for me. And then she turned around to me and said that uh, I was the one who caused it. Um, so shortly thereafter, uh, I was working with a guy at a place we both worked with, and uh, you know he fed off of that situation. And uh, I let him, uh, and I fed right into you know I'm I'm not worthy of anybody and this that and the other. So um, eventually he got in my head. Uh, I lost a bunch of friends, um, and uh, I knew it was going on. So I had moved out of the area in hopes to um, try to end it. And uh, by that point, he followed me out to where I was and. One thing led to another. I came back to the area after, uh, you know, he forced himself on me. And I've had two kids now, um, and I've been through a five-year divorce trying to uh, get out of this relationship. Wow. Um, now, that's kind of like a, I feel like a, a common thing where, <clears throat> excuse me, where the, um, the victim can, like, realize like what's going on but like doesn't quite know what to do and it's almost like a rabbit hole effect yes yeah yeah um yeah I mean it started off you know I I lost friends I I just I wasn't feeling positive about myself and I allowed him to get in my head and I knew at the time um what was going on with that so you know I I had uh pulled myself together enough to uh you know get into an out of out of area college and that was my out, you know, that's what I was gonna do, that's how I was gonna get away, and um, I got myself into a better situation, but, you know, I, it, I, I don't know whether I wasn't strong enough, or, um, you know, I just, I allowed him, you know, I, I told him, we're done, that's it, um, 
And he'd come out and visit, and he'd be like, I drove all this way to come see you. If, you know, I go back now, I'm going to fall asleep, and if I die, it's going to be your fault. Yeah, guilting yeah. you. Guilt trip. So I'd let him stay, and, you know, he got in good with my dad and everything, and my dad would help him, uh, you know, come out to see me by paying him gas money and this and that. And it was, you know, you, you find yourself in these situations where, like, I guess you just allow yourself to be complacent at times um, and give in a little bit just because you think it's the easier solution, the, the easier way to handle it. Or maybe not so much easier, but the, the less dra- drama-ridden yeah. way to handle it. Because um, I'm, I'm a compassionate person, you know, <laughs> and he fed off that. He definitely fed off that. Um, so yeah, after after I had my two kids, it, it only got worse. You know, he he fed into the whole. Um, you know, he he started to make me believe that I was nuts. That uh, you know, I I couldn't make it on my own. Um, and I started believing that. Uh, I really did. Um, and it got to a point where I could see what was going on, but I had no help. I had no family anymore. I had no friends anymore. Um, and I was totally relying on him, um, down to, he had all the bank accounts. He had my keys, he had my phone. And, uh, you know, if he had any inkling that I would be, um, doing anything to try and, you know, get out of the situation, he would, uh, he would stop it. So... Yeah, I mean, there's, you do find yourself in a rabbit hole that sometimes you just don't know a way to get out. You Mm -hmm. know, I know there was a couple times where I called the police because he had done something and the police came out and they would say stuff like, well, we don't see any marks or bruises or, uh," you know, I had this one officer tell me that, uh, um, you know, after a long days of work, uh, there were days where he'd want to come home and just, you know, throw his own kid through a wall. And, and like, you know, what, what do you do when an officer tells you that when you're trying to reach out for help? And it was that day, like, I had tried handing an officer a note, you know, that I had scrambled down, you know, please help. Because I was afraid that, you know, he, my, my ex was, uh, you know, going to make up something or something, this, that, and the other. And um, after the cops left, <laughs> my ex handed the note back to me. And I don't know how he got it, but, yeah, you, I mean, you definitely find yourself in a rabbit hole. Was your ex a smooth talker? Oh, absolutely. You know what, and I, he also plays the stupid card, which he does really well. <laughs> I don't quite know how, but he, he plays um, the well-intending, you know, I, I care about you, I care about your safety, I'm, I'm concerned over you um card very well and you know that that presentation is what people see that he's a very concerning loving person when there's a flip side to that and i mean you you when nobody's looking when nobody's listening you know how how do you even show anybody when they're not willing to uh to provide any help and all they want to accept is that this guy is really loving and caring do you think that you can put into words the, and it, it's, it's even hard to even question it, but this is the question that I've been facing the last three years. Like, can you put into words that that hold that the abuser has on you? It's like they're literally holding on to your heart. Um, early on, yeah. I mean, early on, uh, there, I felt like I, I had a self, um, and he made me question myself like if I didn't help him what was that saying about me um you know if I if I didn't try to you know keep things going what did that say about me you know am I that cruel of a person am I that cold of a person but slowly that disappears and um I'm not sure that in my situation there was really any love involved you know, I, I, very early on, I didn't like this person anymore, and I had tried getting out, and just, you know, he, he managed to find ways back into my life, uh, and he still attempts to do that today, um, but he did it, he used my kids, uh, and he had said that, 
you know, if um, I tried to leave him because I had my daughter before I was even married to him. And I actually got married to him because he had threatened to take my daughter away from me if I didn't. Saying that, uh, you know, I was nuts and um, I would lose custody um, easily. And him and his mom would uh, raise my daughter and I'd never get to see her. Um, so they, you know, they find ways to, to manipulate you. They find ways to, you know, play at your emotions. And I felt, you know, that I, the best way to handle that situation was to get married to that asshole. Oops, sorry. <laughs> I forgot I was on radio. <laughs> it's okay. It's I'll, okay. Um, <laughs> I'll edit myself. <laughs> so um, how do you feel now about the, those threats? Um, I, I, I'm still scared of those threats honestly like back when he used to say he was going to take your children away because of this this and this like how do you feel now looking back like my ex used to say the same thing i'm going to take the kids away who are you you f- you flunked out of college right. you don't you don't have a place to stay your family's crazy just like you're crazy you're a drug addict you're an alcoholic like how do you like those were just I, uh, and i started believing them oh <laughs> absolutely yeah there's there's a point where i, I did believe them and i i I don't know if I totally believe the whole crazy part, but I believe that he had the upper hand. Um, and I still believe at times that he has the upper hand and it makes me livid. It makes me angry that someone who claims that he's a father and wants to be in my children's life could go to that extent and, and do that to my children. You know, um, it makes me angry, you know, that, that there's people that are like that. And, you know, I I have to put some of that blame on myself because, you know, what what would have happened had I, you know, taken my daughter and just fled? You know, would we have been better off? Would she now not be exposed to to this kind of to the own abuse, her own uh, psychological abuse that she gets from her father and that family? So, yeah, I don't know. (laughs) And knowing the kind of abuse that you went through, you you came through the court systems, and like the children still get to see the still have to see the father. Yeah, yep. Um, I'm actually still going through that whole system. Um, there was a a point shortly after I I fled and went to a safe house where, um, he had threatened to kill me. Um, I I had wound up in a very bad situation, and, um. I had gone for help with at the YWCA, and they had given me some pointers and tips, and I, uh, I had already known he was going through all my stuff, and I had attempted to, uh, to rescue some of my computer stuff and some of my business stuff, because I had a home business. And uh, my plan had been to get a U-Haul, you know, get some of my stuff out of there so he couldn't destroy it. Um, and then when my kids got off the bus, you know, grab my kids and go to the safe house. Uh, it didn't quite go that way. Uh, he realized that stuff was missing in, from the house because uh, he had come home earlier than expected. And he got the kids off the bus, and I didn't see him for a good four months. Um, so, yeah, I'm still going through court now to, to settle custody. So right now um, my kids see both um, myself and their father. And it's unfortunate that um, they've requested things from the court system um, that they haven't been provided. My daughter's written, you know, letters to, to her lawyer saying, you know, my dad, my dad hits me. Can you please make that stop? My dad says things to me. Can you please make that stop? You know, she's gone to her school and reported these things. Um, she's gotten CPS involved and still, I mean, it, I, I don't want to um, make victims, you know, believe that the system's not going to be there for them. Uh, it's not my intent, but I mean, there's definitely some situations where you got a question like, what the hell's going on? Like, how can we improve the system so that children aren't caught in the middle and so that their voices are heard? Because I know my kids 
voices aren't. And the turnaround is always that the claim that I'm the one who's, you know, making the kids do this, or I'm the one who's telling my daughter to write letters or this, that, and the other. And how old are your tough. kids? Can you say that? Uh, my son's eight and my daughter's 10. Uh, my daughter has the, the maturity to voice her uh, opinions, her voice, her wants, her needs, her desires. She's had that since uh, she was quite young. My son does not have that capacity. Um, you know, he's very confused with what's going on. So it's it's a difficult situation. Um, and it's even more disheartening when you've got a child who can voice up her objections to things and she's being told, well, she's not old enough to, to have these kind of concerns or her, uh, her opinions don't matter, don't count in this whole, you know, situation. It's such, it's such a sad, it's such a sad thing when, like, and I'm going to commend you, like, your daughter has a voice, and she's speaking, and, like, she's empowered, and that's you. Like, you did that with her. Yeah. But it's, it's sad that she does have a voice, and she does have her own opinions, and she is, like, like, she's so mature, and she's trying to speak up for herself, and people just think that it's coming, it's, like, because it sounds too smart, for a 10 year old that it can't be her voice and it's coming from you yeah yeah and like you know the the fallback on that is like I try to step back now the picture but I mean how can you do that as a mother you know it's that's difficult it is so difficult so I I tell my daughter you know if something comes up go to your school you know tell as many adults as you can so that somebody starts listening and, you know, slowly, this year, she took a huge step in, in approaching her school counselor. Um, I know she did it in the past in elementary school, but she wasn't taken seriously. And nothing ever came of it. So for her to, to keep going, I mean, all I can do is, is tell my daughter, don't give up. You know, there's going to come a point in time. And unfortunately... You know, like, even if the system doesn't listen, even if the system's not doing anything for my children, my children are learning the situation firsthand and who their father is. And it, it's a hard thing for them to have to go through and learn, but, you know, I maybe they have to. I don't know. Have you ever thought about having um, your daughter... Like, because I know she's trying to go through all the sources in the schools, but have you ever thought about having her try to publicize it? Like, ask her who does she want to hear her story and then let her start telling her story? Because the more, I feel like the more people that will hear a 10-year-old story because this 10-year-old, this, this, like, she's speaking up for herself. I feel like people would listen and the, the right people might hear the help. Yeah. Um, well, uh, she reads and writes at an eighth grade level, and this is a, or a ninth grade level, and she's a fifth grader. So what I've been doing with her, um, what I had been working on with her was um, she loves to write. So I, I've been asking her to write in her journal, you know, whatever emotions she has, whatever problems she has, just write it down. And slowly it turned into short stories. And um, my goal, and it's something like I had kind of talked with her before, was to see if she wanted to put together like a little book of short stories. Um, and like, I, I don't want her to focus on abuse. You know, that's, yeah, I don't want to take that and make that the focus of her childhood or her writing. But I guess it's empowering as well as disheartening at times to read some of her stories and discover that they're metaphors. You know, they're a metaphor for a lot of things. Um, she takes notes as she writes, and she'll relabel her characters. And uh, I've seen on a, some of her her um, notes that, like, Mom is this character, Dad Aww. is this character. And it's intriguing. It's it's absolutely intriguing to to watch her grow in this manner. But, yeah, I... I it's a great idea to have her to speak up like that. I have, like, so many ideas going through my head. Because <laughs> I know April's coming up, and April, I think, is Child Abuse Awareness Month. Oh, really? Do you know anything about that? No, I didn't. It's either... Like, I, I, somebody just said it, and if I'm wrong, I'm sorry, listeners. <laughs> 
But it, like if April was Child Abuse Awareness Month, maybe we could come together and do some kind of not not raising funds per se, but raising awareness much like this, but having like a destination where we all come together and children are allowed to come and they can speak and she we can put her in charge and like like let her dream soar for that fundraiser. Oh god, that's a great idea. If you're actually involved, if you're if you're and listeners, if, like you can tell me what you think about this too. WBNY Public Affairs at uh, gmail dot com. Um, we we can put we can try to put this together. Yeah. It can, yeah, it, it can uh, just be like one awesome. day. Like, uh, just do, are you? Do you have them on like a specific weekend? We can plan for that. Yeah. Um. Uh, yeah. Every other weekend right now. Okay. We can put this together. I will post it on the event page and see what we can come up with. Excellent. I would love to. Like, I want to see. I, and I don't know if it, is it bad. I want to see what she's made of. <laughs> yeah. No. Um. The more ways I can teach my daughter to speak up and empower herself, the better. And I know we had we had Susan Perry on on Monday. And oh, I'm she sure was she, excellent. I loved I it. I loved her interview. And let everybody know, uh, uh, Susan Perry is joining Vanity Violence's board of directors. <laughs> Sweet. Um, but I know that we might be able to get her on board. And my niece, um, she might want to listen in or uh, come in and do some kind of speaking. I know, like, and I had just talked to her about, I was talking to her about Vanity Violence, and she was telling me about a project she was working on in school. And she was designing a vanity salon because she's in cosmetology. Oh. So she was putting, Beautiful. like, donations off to Vanity Violence. And it, it's, it's, it's one, like, I she's 17 and she 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 was answering her questions during her interview and i'm just over here answering her questions in my head and she's saying exactly <laughs> what i'm saying i'm like oh my god this girl <laughs> i love it watching children have their voices yeah yes and you know what it like my daughter she's in a situation where um she's she's taught that women are not allowed to speak up there's a very old school mentality in my ex-husband's family where you know women are just the support women are the ones who are at home cooking cleaning doing all the the kitchen work this that the other barefoot and pregnant Um, yeah (laughs) oh oh, yeah yeah. (laughs) and you know i there was a point where i snuck out and put resumes in at a bunch of different places not expecting that I'd ever get hired, and I actually wound up hired as a GM someplace. And um, because, like, you can't have that. You can't allow yourself to think in the manner that women are subpar or else you just let yourself go and you stop You stop caring. Your motivation disappears. And that's something I, I don't want to happen to my daughter, especially at such a young age, being exposed to that kind of mentality. That's where my ideas came from because I, do, I want her to know that like like people cherish those words, and she could be she could be the voice for other people that are li- living that same thing. Yeah. Now, um, <clears throat> what kind of uh, barriers have you faced since you empowered yourself to like leave your abuser? Oh my God, <laughs> barriers. <laughs> um. Oh, there's been so many. It feels like every time, you know, I take a couple steps forward, I take, like, 5,000 steps backwards. Um, and, and they come across as, like, barriers from the system as well as my own barriers. Um, barriers from the system. Man, I've my ex-husband is very compelling at telling people I'm nuts and crazy. Um, right down to whenever officers had to come to the house, you know, I'm nuts, I'm whack. Um, He used to say I was on medication or I was off my medication or something like that. I don't know, I was never on any medication. So, um, barriers, I mean, there's a, you get to a point where the cops come to your house so many times, they're like, oh, this again. Or during that four months where I was without my kids, you know, I, I tried relentlessly trying to go see them and you know, the system, the, the sheriffs would tell me, well, there's no court order saying that you've got custody, so you can't go see them. And no, there wasn't a, a court order. There was nothing yet. Um, so why wasn't I allowed to see my children? Um, you know, while, while he was hiding them with, you know, his family away from me. Um, it's the, the system itself, I've, I've been... Um, I started off in 
family court. Uh, after a really bad incident, I um, went to family court to try to get custody and, you know, all the other crap, like child support, alimony, or whatever, and, and do the divorce thing um, in family court. So I filed my paperwork after I had approached them saying, hey, let's uh, use one of the YWCA's resources and get a divorce, you know, with a mediator and uh, use a hundred bucks. I paid for it, no problem. We just get this done, taken care of, and we'd move on. He was like, nope, never. You're never gonna get divorced from me. Um, so, you know, I, I wound up in family court filing for the paperwork. And when I did that, he turned around and filed paperwork in Supreme Court. Um, and so even though he filed after me, I became a defendant when everything got pushed up to Supreme Court. Um, and once it got there, I mean, some of the, the barriers in the system itself, you know, I, I've only been in front of the judge maybe four times in the past four years. Um, I, I, we went to court, I think it was, I first filed April of 2011. So I think the four year mark is coming up, going into year five of the divorce and like I had told him you know I had tried getting a divorce several times prior uh you know he'd rip up paperwork on me and stuff this before I could get it filed in court but um you know once it got to Supreme Court um uh, I was only in front of the judge a couple times I've never been able to raise any of the issues with the domestic violence in front of the uh Supreme Court it was supposed to go to IDV court transfer papers um were sent to IDV court however uh, the judge said, well, this was never an IDV case, um, and then held my case when IDV got transferred back to another location. Um, so I, I don't know. There's, you know, as far as barriers go, there's there's tons. It's been difficult, um, right down to, you know, how do I care for my children? I tried getting them counseling, um, and their father was allowed to go in and change appointments around and I was never informed of the appointment changes and they got dismissed as clients. Um, you know, he took them off the insurance I had and made sure that it was an insurance that didn't cover uh, counseling and stuff like that. So, I don't know. Um, I face barriers, like, <laughs> all the time. I don't want the listeners right now to think that when you leave your abuser all of this stuff happens. Yeah, no. And but there exactly there it's, are times like in this case right now where there's barriers and obstacles everywhere and she's running through an obstacle course and she can't keep up because he just keeps changing the layout. Yes. Yes. <laughs> and the problem with this right now, and this is going out to all the listeners right now, the statistics that we have one in four women, one in six men are experiencing or are having or living around domestic violence, whether it be their friends, family, coworkers, just the people aren't speaking up as much as they should. Like our statistics, like they, they may be statistics and they're scientifically proven, but at the same time, most actual cases are never talked about. They're never like, they're never, they don't go through the system. So the problem that we're facing is we don't have enough people like us willing to talk about domestic violence. There's a stigma associated with domestic violence that makes people think that we don't want to talk about this. We can't be a victim because vi we, people will look down on us if we're victims, and that's not, it's not the way it should be. And yeah. if we all stand up and we speak out, they have to change the laws because they'll start to realize the, how many more people this is touching than even we thought. Yeah. I think um, just touching on the, the barriers thing, um, yeah, I don't want victims to think that there's no hope if they get out. Um, I think one of my own barriers that I had mentioned before, um, some of the guilt lays on me because I was, I was way too embarrassed to ever speak up for myself. I had way too much shame in the whole situation that went on, and... For me to even have gone to the YWCA and say, I need help, was something that took loads of guts for me to do. Because, mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I, I put myself in um, a few prominent roles, um, you know, in the community. And 
yeah, I hid bruises. You know, there was a few times where people would be like, what happened to your face? I'd be like, oh, yeah, my son, you know, he left his toys out in the living room and I tripped over it. And, you know, the stupid lies that, that we, we tell. Um, but you've got to speak up. I mean, you've, you've got to lay everything out on the table and, and really just tell people what happened. Otherwise, people are just going to assume, well, it wasn't that bad or, well, you know what, you know, it's, you're, you're just worrying over nothing. No, that, that beephole tried to kill me, (laughs) you know, like, (laughs) how, (laughs) how do you relate that to somebody when you're too fearful to even, even speak up about it? And I think, I think that the, see, you're touching on it, but um, victims, they feel like they're alone. Yes. And yeah. like stepping out of it in hindsight, 2020, like we were so not alone. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's, it just blows my mind how we feel like we're alone and we're embarrassed, but like it happens to everybody. Yeah. It doesn't matter. You can be the CEO of a fortune 500 company and be going through domestic violence. You just don't show it. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you, you've got to put your own ego aside, too, if, if that's what you fear. You, you've got to put that aside and say, look, I need help. And then that's your first step. I mean, admitting to yourself that you actually, this is a situation you can't handle alone. And then going out and getting that help. You are going to have people there to help you. You just have to make that first move. I know, and I don't know if it happens in every case, but when you leave your abuser and you're telling people about the things that you came from, the things that went, the things that you experience, almost every single time, there's a click in that conversation, and you're like, "Whoa!" <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Because saying it out loud is so much more than just remembering it. Because you can remember it, but your brain is going to it, it can it can do your brain can do almost anything to make sure that you feel comfortable. But as you're saying it out loud, you're like, "Wow, that happened," and I, d- <laughs> it didn't even click. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, is there anything that you want to add to this interview? Um, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to listeners, anybody listeners, attorneys, anybody that thinks that they might be able to help. She's been going through a divorce for, she said, she's going into the fifth year. And, <laughs> like, I don't know if they're fee building, but um, sh- people, we need some advice. <laughs> yeah. So you can contact me again, WBNY uh, Public Affairs Dr- no, not director. Pub- WBNY Public Affairs at gmail.com. You can call in 716-878-5104. Just let us know what you think. And I want to thank you again, guest number two of Week of the Warriors, day three, for coming in today. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> cool. All right, guys, uh, we're going to start up with the uh, the next interview. We have uh, Mary Murphy on the line. You want to say hi? Hi. <laughs> Okay. So, uh, do you want to just give a quick introduction on uh, yourself and just tell us what you do? Sure. My name is Mary Murphy. I'm the executive director of the Family Justice Center. We're an agency that caters to victims and their children of domestic abuse and violence. We have a unique model where we bring together everything a person and their children need uh, for safety, uh, to document their injuries, to hold their abuser accountable if they are so inclined. We can secure orders of protection for our clients right from uh, one of our three beautiful centers. So we take everything they need, put it in one spot, and uh, we understand that it's a journey and that they may need many, many services. And uh, so we spell out all the services and all the different things we can do for them, and then we let our clients decide exactly what they want to choose in terms of the services and the different partners that they may want to see. Okay. Um, now, just like a quick like thing, um, what, <laughs> how would you describe domestic violence? Like, what would be your definition? Well, we define it. We boil it, we've boiled it down to one word, so you can file it right up in your brain and pull it out to use as a yardstick. Are you? Are you not? Is your best friend, your coworker, your mom, your sister? Is he? Is he not? We do see male victims. The majority of victims are women and girls. But we define it as control. One person trying to control every aspect of another person's life. They do that through violence. That's a tool that abusers use. 
They use the threat of violence, dangling that threat over the head of their victim in order to control them. And they use an array of emotional and psychological tools and abuse uh, to control. Again, it's about power and control, one person trying to dominate every aspect of another person's life. So it doesn't necessarily have to be violent to be considered abusive. Power and control, that's the simple definition, and it's a complex issue. Okay. <clears throat> Sorry. And um, can you just give us like a background on what the Family Justice Center is? Well, as I just said, we're an a, a agency that brings together numerous partners addressing anything and everything a person and their children need to escape. Uh, back, oh my goodness, going 15 years back, a group of about 100 people or more here in Erie County got together to try to figure out there's got to be a better way to deliver services to victims of abuse, domestic abuse and violence. And they realized that often when somebody makes that determination to leave a dangerous, abusive relationship, they need to go to family court to secure an order of protection. What they found was that people were in court and uh, to get that order of protection, and uh, it, it's a long process, and if you're, you're frightened and you're traumatized because you're a victim of abuse, it's a difficult place. It can be a difficult place to navigate. So what this group found was maybe we should take all the services somebody needs, including getting an order of protection, put it in one place, and they thought one of the great things about this model would be was a, a video conferencing room where we could take our clients in the sanctuary and safety of our beautiful office put them in what we call a little courtroom in the closet and have video conferencing capabilities so that a person needing an order of protection can do that right from the Family Justice Center via video conferencing. Now it's a more sophisticated Skyping type interaction, but a person can get that order of protection right from our Family Justice Center. We fax over to family court their petition for the order of protection after explaining to them what it's all about. We do a danger assessment, a risk assessment with them, so we can understand better what kind of danger they may be in or what kind of abuse has been going on. And that's something that we can articulate in the petition so the judge or the attorney referee making the decision and whether it rises to the legal level to grant the order of protection, the judge or the attorney referee has a good, solid foundation on which to make the decision. And right at the bench is the video, the monitor, and right in the Family Justice Center, in our little courtroom in the closet next to the Bible where we swear the client in, is another video monitor. And so the judge and the client can converse back and forth, even though they're not in the same room. And when the judge grants the order, it's faxed over to the Family Justice Center, and then our domestic violence advocate who's working with the client can sit the client down and explain to them what an order of protection is all about and the many responsibilities on the part of the victim to understand so that it can be effective. And then when they need to go back to court with the, uh, to, to face the abuser, these are emergency ex parte orders of protection. That means the person, the, the abuser, will get the day in court. We accompany the uh, client to court, so they have a court advocate who can kind of hold their hand a little bit and talk them through what's going to happen so they don't feel that it's hit or miss or that this is a scary, tough place to negotiate. There's somebody right there with them explaining what's going on every step of the way. Okay. <coughs> Jess, do you want to? Um, my question is this. Uh, how does the Family Justice Center help victims or someone looking to help a friend or family member? They can... What they can do is hop on our website. You just Google up Family Justice Center of Erie County. There's all sorts of ad advice. There's a, what we have on our website is a healthy relationship checklist, and it's an expanded list of questions that somebody can ask themselves or you could sit down with somebody. But I think the most important thing is to give us a call. And uh, if you need some advice on helping somebody, number one, you want to encourage them to come in. And you can take them by the hand and bring them in and uh, do a little homework first on the Family Justice Center website so that you can have a conversation with them. Ooh, saw this interesting agency, and here's what they do, and maybe the two of us could walk in together. Um, obviously, it's, everything is confidential, so we wouldn't be able to let the friend in with the client, 
but the client can come in and just learn about everything we do. Or she can call or he can call, and uh, we have advocates who answer the phone who can walk them through what to expect if they were to come in or give them an outline of what our services are or answer any kind of question that they may have or the friend may have in terms of trying to help their friend who they suspect or know is in a, in a difficult, dangerous, mm-hmm. abusive relationship. Yeah. Thank you um, how, uh, can you tell me about all the different partners related to the Family Justice Center and how they can help you? Well, if you need an order of protection, we partner with 8th Judicial District, that's Family Court, for the video conferencing, and our advocates can sit down with clients and spell out all the different options when it comes to orders of protection and answer any questions. And then our domestic violence advocates can actually draft the petitions, help the client draft the petitions, and we fax them over. It's one of our most popular services. We have one of the only, if not the only, forensic medical unit dedicated to domestic violence in all of New York State. Our partner is... University of Buffalo Family Medicine, Dr. Chet Fox oversees it. We have a forensic medical unit nurse right on staff who can body map the injuries on an electronic map of the body. She medically describes the injuries and takes high-tech digital pictures of the injuries as well. And this is to document the injuries for our abusers who want them document, or for our clients who want them documented or if they want to have them documented and hold their abuser accountable. The district attorney, another one of our partners, they're on site. So anybody who wants to get a rundown of of what is involved in filing charges can sit with the district attorney's domestic violence advocate. She's a social worker. She has her master's degree. She can explain the process of filing charges, and if the client is interested in holding the abuser accountable, can help them do that. Uh, Buffalo police are there. Anybody who calls police in the city of Buffalo with a domestic violence complaint gets a domestic incident report, we call those DIRs, along with a card saying if you want to file charges, come to the Family Justice Center, at which point they can walk through our front door, sit down with an advocate, learn about all the different partners and all the different services available, and then actually meet with, we have two full-time on-site Buffalo Police Department personnel there, uh, an officer and a warrant clerk who can get the charges into the system and out to the district where the abuser is living. And again, these two Buffalo Police Department personnel can sit with a client and explain to them the process of filing charges. And if they want to file charges, they can do that right at the Family Justice Center. We have the International Institute on speed dial. If we have anybody with any kind of cultural concerns or special needs, we can get them in there. We have language line in our living rooms. We have these beautiful living rooms overlooking a breathtaking view of the waterfront where our clients meet with our domestic violence advocates and get all their services, and it's relaxing. We give them something to eat. We give them something to drink. We have a beautiful playroom, so if the kids want a little break or mom wants a little break, they can go into the playroom where we have trained volunteers to play with the kids and talk to the kids, and it's just an adorable room. Uh, So anything anybody needs, any questions they may have, they can get everything there in one spot. I'm giving you kind of the thumbnail sketch. Mm -hmm. We have New York State Police has an incredible domestic violence advocate named Martha LaCourte, who's been doing this work for more than 30 years, and she can help people um, with the crime victims, reimbursement uh, if they... uh, need money if they've spent money trying to escape um, their abuser. So again, we can sit with our clients and spell out all the different services and all the different uh, partners available. Child Advocacy Center uh, is a close partner of ours, and if the children are interested in, or the parents are interested for the children's therapeutic play, a full-blown assessment, counseling, we can get the Child Advocacy Center right on the line in one of our living rooms. We're starting to use more telephone. Um, We're starting to use Skyping, uh, more technology to link our clients with our partners because it's not always viable to have a partner right there on site. But we're thinking, oh, my goodness, with all this technology, we can bring them right into the room via telephone, via Skyping, via computer. 
so we're using more of that. We have two satellite offices, one in Orchard Park and one in Williamsville, where we can secure those orders of protection right from our Williamsville office with Family Court, and we're about to do it any day now here from our Orchard Park satellite office so that, again, clients don't have to go downtown to get what we need, what they need. We know suburbanites sometimes don't want to go up to Buffalo for a variety of reasons. We understand that. So that's why we have our two beautiful Family Justice Center satellite offices in the village of Hamburg, in the, I'm sorry, in the village of Orchard Park and in Williamsville. If someone is facing domestic violence, what are some important things you think that they need to hear um, to help them with their process to get out? I think a few things. Number one, I think they need to understand that they're not responsible for the abuse. They absolutely do not deserve it, and it certainly is not their fault. I have a group of 25 women and girls, 25 of them, ranging in age from 19 to 82, who got out of abusive relationships. And they tell me when they were in the midst of what would be defined as classic domestic violence or abuse, they didn't see themselves. They never viewed themselves as a victim of that. They thought, yeah, domestic violence, that's something that happens to people living in trailer parks in the south or people living in ghettos in the inner city, not understanding that this is about power and control. They called it things like a difficult relationship, a roller coaster relationship, a rocky relationship. It wasn't until a friend or a boss or a coworker or a neighbor or a nurse or a social worker or even a family member put the checklist in front of their face. Does he control your every move? Are you frightened of this person? Uh, do they have uncontrollable bouts of anger and jealousy? Is every text you write read? Every call that comes in, does he know about it? Have you been stopped? Have you ever been beaten up when you were pregnant or shoved? Or, you know, and they're looking at this checklist realizing, okay, this isn't just a difficult relationship or he doesn't just have anger issues. This is a bona fide abusive relationship. And often that's like when it goes off in their brain that this, this is what's going on here, an abuse, an abusive relationship. It, it goes off like fireworks on, on the 4th of July when it dawns on them, okay, this is what's going on. And my 25 women who go out tell me that they were brainwashed by their abuser. And understand, abusers are very, very talented at this game of power and control. And they brainwash their victims into believing that the abuse is their fault and that they do deserve it and that they are somehow responsible for it. And that's the trauma, too, playing in. Understand, abusers aren't always abusers. They can be charming, loving angels. And that's what victims fall in love with, not understanding that the real person is the monster that they've seen maybe weeks or months, a long time after they fell in love with that angel. And again, not understanding that the angel is not the real person. The real person is the monster, and they're not going to change that monster. The angel is the fake person. I always used to say that the abuser for me felt like that the because you go back in um, to people telling you that they, you have two angels on your shoulder. One of them is the angel and the other one's the devil. So you have like the regular angel, which is like your gut and your conscious. And those are, those are your things that you're thinking. Then you have your abuser, which is the devil on your shoulder telling you the worst of everything. Right, right. And but what my 25 women who tell me, they just want the abuse to stop. And they want that angel they fell in love with to be there 24-7. And what we tell our clients and what victims need to understand, you're not going to change this person. You know, at, periodically, the beautiful, loving angel is going to be there apologizing and promising that, that la the latest, whatever form of abuse was, will never happen again. And he or she, so, 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 so sorry. I don't know what got into me. And again, never, ever, ever taking responsibility for the abuse, right? Blaming it on somebody else. Yeah, exactly. I was with my boss that day, and he makes me crazy. And you were the first person I saw, and I just took it out on you, but it was my boss's fault. Never, ever taking responsibility for the abuse. And that's one of the big red flags. And when you look at the extended checklist on our website, that's one of the things that helps make crystal clear for a victim 
that, yeah, this goes beyond a difficult relationship or a rocky relationship or a roller coaster relationship. This is abuse. And I think the interesting aspect of this scourge on our society is that the abusers, they're all playing out of the same handbook. Exactly. They're all playing out of the same handbook. So if we can teach kids, especially at young age, at young ages, what a healthy relationship constitutes and what the warning signs, what the big red flags are, we can stop this abuse. We understand, too, that the trauma is devastating. The trauma associated with these relationships is absolutely devastating, and it undermines a person's ability to think clearly, to even articulate accurately what's going on in the relationship, and to make logical decisions. We talk to women every day who are returning to the abuse, and they say, yeah, I'm going back, I'm going back because he'll kill me if I walk out the door. He reads my mind. He told me if I even thought about leaving, he would kill me. So, yeah, I'm going to go back until I can get a plan in place when I can safely get myself out and my children out and live to talk about it. And that's one of the critical things we do with the Family Justice Center. Our advocates listen to the clients, hear exactly what's going on, and then draft a safety plan. They call they, they, they develop a safety plan, customize a safety plan based on what the client is telling them, a customized safety plan. We go put it right up there in their head. We don't dare write it down. We know the most dangerous time to leave, or a dangerous time in one of these abusive relationships is when the, the victim makes the decision to leave. The power and the control are coming unraveled for the abuser, and that's a dangerous time because the abuser is losing control and uh, anything can happen at that point. Yeah, so all crazy. of our clients, even if they just came in to get a lineup of what the services are, uh, get a safety plan so that we can keep them safe while they go through this journey. We know it takes on average seven to eight attempts to permanently leave an abusive relationship. That's the safety issues and the trauma playing into it. Children being used as pawns in these cases is a very popular method of control on the part of these abusers. You know, you leave, I'll kill those kids. Or you leave, I'll hire the best attorney in town because I control all the money. You won't have any money, so you won't have an attorney. We'll get witness after witness after witness on that witness stand to declare you an unfit mother, and the county will award me or the judge will award me custody, and I'll cut off all access, and you'll never see the kids again. So these are the tactics abusers use. We sit down with clients and help them understand this whole power and control cycle or wheel and uh, safety plan with them. And uh, we're, we're there. Our, our advocates are there for them, helping them in every aspect because it is multifaceted. And we want them to understand that we have their back. And uh, we're here to listen and we're here to guide and to help. We never make decisions for our clients, right? We, we understand every many facets of their lives are being controlled. So we'd like to give a little control back by spelling out all the different services and all the different options and then letting them make the decisions. And it's a process, so we never want to tell them what to do. We want them to feel perfectly comfortable returning for more services as they progress on their journey. Um, now, if someone were to uh, want to like, volunteer with the Family Justice Center, um, like, how would they go about doing that? Well, like, we, we have tours. You need to take a tour of the Family Justice Center, okay. and uh, we can meet with you after the tour. We have a great pamphlet that spells out all the different volunteer options. We have, I would say, periodically we have people who have gotten out of abusive relationships and who hasn't been all that long, and they're ready to volunteer, and we need to sit with them and say, whoop, not so fast. We want you to be 100% healed. So there is a screening process, but a whole bunch of different options that they can choose if they're interested in volunteering. We do a ton of training and we do security checks and background checks and and more training and we have fundraising opportunities and all sorts of committees, public outreach, how to get our materials into the hands of the public so that they know we exist and that we have these two beautiful satellites in the suburbs as well as our agency downtown. All sorts of options for volunteers, but we always have them start with a tour. And the tour dates are listed on our website. Okay. And um, <clears throat> also, um, kind of like 
tagging off of that, what about like a if somebody were to like want to try and get like a partnership, like how would that connection? They happen? can call me. Okay. If if any agency is out there listening and would would like to partner with us, I'm all ears. Okay. So they can call. It. My name is Mary Murphy. I'm the executive director of the Family Justice Center. All our information is on our website. Just Google Family Justice Center Erie County, and it all pops up. And we would love to hear from anybody who would like to share their story. My email address is on there. Nobody reads my email except for me, and my direct phone line is on there, and nobody hears or answers my calls except for me. Love to hear stories of people and anybody out there thinking, oh, I need to help my sister. I wonder if I could call Mary. Yep, you can absolutely call me, and I can put you on the line with a domestic violence advocate to guide you. Any step. Any, anywhere you need to go with it. Awesome. And um, what does the future of Family Justice Center look like? Well, hopefully we're going to continue to grow and expand. And we're, we have five full-time employees. Many of the advocates who line our hallways don't work for us, obviously. They work for the agencies that place them there. I'd like to get more partners involved and get Family Justice Center satellites wherever they're needed. But most importantly, I'd like to get the word out to the public that we exist. and We can really use volunteers. We have phenomenal posters and our brochure. We have a really cool brochure that spells out. We, we picked from the, the more extensive healthy relationship checklists and put some of those in our brochures. And one of our women Part of my 25 women who got out shares her story right on the brochure. She's an attorney from Williamsville with two kids who shares her story. And then we have the, our locations and phone numbers of the different agencies. So I'd love to have more volunteers getting the word out that this incredible center and our satellite offices exist. So people don't have to go from place to place to place trying to get everything they need in order to, to live a life free of abuse or to secure a, a safe haven, or healing, or, or hope. Yeah. I went, uh, I had a fundraising class last semester, and I took a tour of Family Justice Center. That's how I actually met Mary Murphy. And um, I was just in awe during that entire oh. tour. And I remember being there back when I first left, and I was from Niagara County, so I couldn't do much at Family Justice Center. But I met um, Barbara Peoples in the legal aid, um, rest in peace. The late Barbara Peoples. Oh, my goodness. I almost, I, I've left out partners here because I'm trying to be quick. I know you have, are under time deadline. Neighborhood Legal Services is our on-site partner. They're five days a week. They can help with divorce, support, custody. Phenomenal partner, Neighborhood Legal Services. They're right in our building. And I can tell you, we're in the main Seneca building downtown, right at the foot of Main Street, right across the street from Pearl Street Brewery. And... Um, Neighborhood Legal Services is probably one of the most, if not the most, popular service on the part of our clients. And we have numerous other not-for-profit legal agencies in our building, and we've cultivated relationships with them. So if somebody has a legal issue that doesn't fall right on, under the umbrella of Neighborhood Legal Services, we can get an attorney from one of the other not-for-profit legal entities in our building, right there in the room with our client. They'll come up on the elevator or down on the elevator, depending on what floor they're on, and sit face-to-face -face where we get them on, our, on the phone with our client. And uh, it's such a wonderful, uh, a wonderful way to link clients with, with more services. They're in our building, so why not, right? Exactly. <laughs> um, any last words? Our, our phone number is 558 Seven two three three. Haven House and, and Crisis Services have been our partners since we opened. Haven House, of course, runs the emergency shelter, does long-term uh, counseling. Crisis Services does the crisis uh, counseling piece and court advocacy. But five five eight seven two three three is our number, and we can we're happy to answer any questions. And if anybody wanted to. Uh, directly contact me. Again, my contact information is on our website, and everything is confidential. And our message to people out there still suffering, we have your back. We have your back. You do not deserve this. It is not your fault. And despite the best efforts of your abuser into brainwashing you that you are somehow responsible for this, you're not. Not your fault. And we are here to help. We have your back. We understand what you're going through. And, uh, 
we won't judge and everything is confidential. All right. Thank you so much. That was uh, Mary Murphy from the Family Justice Center. Thank you, ladies, for having me. I appreciate it. Thank you so much. I'm in awe over here. You're doing amazing work. (laughs) Well, come again on another tour and bring everybody you know. Okay. (laughs) (laughs) All right. Bye, girls. Have a nice day. You too. Bye-bye. Bye. All right. um, That concludes the, uh, was it the third interview? Yep. Today? Yeah. Um, we're here with, uh, Brayton. You guys know him. Hey. <laughs> What's happening, everybody? Yep. Um, we're, uh, we're going to talk about domestic violence and sports. Yep. Um, so, I mean, I already introduced you, so there's mm-hmm. that. That's, yeah. That's covered. Yeah. Um, so what do you do? Well, uh, for everybody that doesn't know, uh, I am a DJ and also a radio personality here at WBMY. Um, I did have a I did have a morning show from seven to nine on Monday, Tuesdays, and Thursdays. However, with my with my schedule that I've had this past semester, uh, that has since gone off the schedule, so I don't have that uh, show anymore. However, I am the producer for uh, Neutral Ice every Monday night at 8 p.m. as part of All Talk Monday. Uh, besides that, I do some play-by-play broadcasting for uh, the men's and women's hockey team here at Buff State. Uh, I also have a job at Buffalo's Timeless Radio. WECK is a producer there. I produce uh, Kanisha's men's basketball games. And I also am a, you can call, on on-call producer, I guess, uh, for Saturday morning talk shows when they need a producer, it's just like, hey, Brayton, can you come in and do this morning? Yeah, sure, I could do it. I, I don't mind. Uh, and then I'm also interning at WGR Sports Radio 550 right now, uh, just doing a little bit of everything uh, under the supervision of the always pleasant Tom Sitch. So you could say that you're uh, kind of a sports guru. Yeah, I mean, sports, In I mean, more of a hockey guru, but I mean, I'm I cover I follow all sports, so it doesn't it it doesn't really matter. I just I'm just a very big uh, sports enthusiast, but hockey is sort of like my my go to sport. But yeah, but yeah, I mean, you know, I'm busy with radio just in general. I love radio; it's what I want to get into. So yeah, uh, I'll be graduating in May from Buffalo State here with a degree with a bachelor's degree in media production, and uh, yeah, and so. For everybody listening out there, if you're a student or somebody, if not only a student, but I mean, if you're somebody looking to go back to college or go to college from high school, Buffalo State has definitely one of the best communication programs in the state. It's accredited. Yes, very. It's accredited. The only SUNY college that is accredited in the entire state, and there's five colleges that are accredited. Buffalo State is the only SUNY college accredited. Um, in communication so that's that's pretty that's saying something for sure yeah because i mean it's cheap and you're getting your money's worth yeah absolutely and for for anybody coming in here i would absolutely for into the communications uh department um i would absolutely recommend coming to wb and y and trying to become a part-time dj a full-time dj or getting yourself immersed in um our e-board or, or just anything with with WB and Y, you can just do sports specifically, which is more of what I'm doing now is more of sports. But I mean, there's so much here. We we offer so many opportunities for people to to host shows, to do really whatever they want to do here at, at the radio station. And I think it's a great luxury that this college has that more people need to take advantage of. Yeah, no, I agree. Mm-hmm. Um, all right, now into the domestic violence since this is the yes. week of Warriors. Yes. Um, so. Uh, you're our fourth guest today. Yeah. Um, so when was, when was the first time you can remember like thinking about domestic violence? Well, domestic violence, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm very fortunate and lucky to have never been in uh, a relationship or a family that has experienced domestic violence. So I'm very grateful for that. But I just, I just hear so many stories, uh, especially in the sports world and, and on the news uh, of, of domestic violent disputes going on where, where um, you know, 
wives are getting beaten by their husbands or wives are beating their husbands or or just in general kids are getting beaten up by their parents other people are just beating each other or just just in general just any domestic dispute um you hear about it a lot on the news you hear it a lot in the media um on twitter facebook it's 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 sort of startling to hear some of the stories that come out um especially when it's a when it's a breaking news story or something like that at six o'clock on channel seven or channel mm-hmm. two or wherever it is or you know you're on your facebook page one day somebody posts something like oh my god how could somebody do this this is disgusting yeah. and it's not even it's not uh, it's all you know it, it really is sad it's it's i wouldn't say uh, i guess you could say it's it, to some people it would be disgusting yeah. with with this activity that goes on yeah no i agree completely mm-hmm. um now, you were talking about how, like, you see it, like, in the news, like, with sports-related yeah. stuff. Um, like, what do you, what are your thoughts on that, like, with, like, how much it happens, like, within the sport sports world? Surprisingly enough, it happens more than everybody thinks. Um, I'm not sure what entails an athlete or whoever it is in sports to do what they do, but, um, you know, it happens way, way too often. You almost hear about it too much with a player taking advantage of their child or taking advantage of their wife or something like that. Um, and it's it's been brought about more than in past years. I think in past years it's been, you know, sort of like just sweeped off. And, and now it's a time where it's changing because back then, you know, men were subject to be, you know, the, the higher up person in the family so if the wife did something they may hit them or something like that and it may just be pushed off to the side it wouldn't be brought about well now it's now it's brought about daily where it's like even if even if the husband hits the wife and you know it's the first time and the only time it's still brought out and still talked about and it's still disputed mm-hmm. so i mean yeah, especially lately, there's been so many different ones coming out. I mean, there was just one recently in NASCAR. Of all places, NASCAR <laughs> had one. There's one in hockey that has been that took place earlier this year, um, and that's still going on. There's a few in football. Uh, it's yeah. it's incredible. It's it's unreal how many of these issues are coming about more and more nowadays. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, I agree. I feel like every year there's like at least one case that like pops up in the news and mm-hmm. it's, it's a little like unsettling cause you know, like you, it, it, sh- I feel like it shouldn't be this common. Like it's not something that. No, no, it shouldn't, it shouldn't be common. It should be, you know, regulated. It should be, you know, talked about more and and discussed more, especially when, you know, a couple, I'm getting married in September. So I haven't gone through the, the, you know, the seminars or the talks of like, you know, what it, what it means to be married and everything like meeting with a minister or meeting with a priest or whoever you're meeting with before the wedding. I'm actually going to be doing that later on this week, but you would you would think that you would want to talk to somebody like a counselor or something about it before getting married like you know yeah. is this the right decision like can you two talk about argument talk about something and have or if you're having an argument can you talk about it without getting physical without you know getting into a screaming match or a yelling match it's it's just can you be civil about it yeah. and i think a lot of people some people they just jump to jump to weddings and they don't they don't necessarily care or they don't do like the research or they don't talk about it it's just like it's almost sometimes you know oh let's just get married okay let's get married Mm -hmm. and then later on when they're married there's so many divorces nowadays because it's like you don't know how to handle it some people just have three-month relationships they think it's the it's the perfect match and then you get married i've been with my fiance for six and a half years and we've gone through a lot we've been through fights we've been through disputes we've been through so much we've we've had a couple of things happen in our lives that affected us personally but we we have to know to get through it and i think a lot of people have to realize you know if something like this comes up you got to be able to get through it yeah and more and more nowadays i think people don't realize that i think people don't think about it i think they're just so quick to jumping to it instead of taking the time just being together getting to know one another Mm -hmm. um 
and, and and really that's that's just such a focus you have to know what you're getting yourself into because yeah. if you don't and and sometimes women just think it's just the normal where really people just you can't think that you can't think that oh well you know i'm an abusive relationship but you know what this is how it's supposed to be it's like no you you, you can't be like this all the time and i think that when you are in a relationship you need to be more more aware, more aware of what you're getting yourself into. So when you're in a relationship, um, do the homework. Talk to somebody before you're getting married. Talk to somebody if you're having issues. Um, talk to a friend. Talk to a family member. Don't be afraid to bring up issues to other people that may be able to help you out in the future. Yeah, and um, I, I agree with you on that. And uh, I feel like uh, like it it's not just the physical aspect. Like mm-hmm. you, you shouldn't. It shouldn't be like in order for me, this relationship to work, I have to tear this person down. Mm -hmm. Um, Because like being in a sorority, like I always get like the, oh, hazing, you know, and like in a way, like I guess that can kind of be like domestic violence, but like it. But there's different ways to haze people. Yeah. There's there's different ways. It's it's not like the I think it happened. It had to have happened about 10 years ago when uh the students in I think it was the Wilson School District yep. up yeah where uh they were in the back of the bus and I think they were beaten or something like that with uh with or something happened where they had a they were getting hazed in the back of the bus and they were being physically hazed and yeah. it became a huge issue and uh people were fired for it it also happened in uh in Florida Florida International University the marching band they had a uh they had a hazing ritual for all the newcomers where you would have to run from the back of the bus to the front of the bus and get off. And as you're going, you're getting hit with you're getting hit with whatever they want to hit you with. Yeah. Well, a student actually died from it because he got hit. He went down and they just kept beating him and beating him. And he eventually blacked out into a coma and he died. Wow. So that kind of stuff, uh, that kind of stuff is unacceptable. Right. It's it's the certain it's the certain things like, uh, oh, hey, in, in sports, let's go back to sports here. The, the right way to haze somebody, maybe, is just, hey, rookie, carry all my luggage, carry all my baggage in, to the locker room or something like that. That's fine. There, there's certain things we're hazing. It's just like, you know, yeah, go take, care of, go take care of the dirty laundry or something like that. Go do the laundry yeah. for all of us. And, you know, as we're going to eat sit here, watch a movie, eat popcorn, you're going to do the laundry. Yeah. I mean, like, it hazing is generally unacceptable. Right. But, um, like... There's no reason to, like, tear someone down to, like, make them dependent. Like, the the power struggle thing is just, it's, I feel, it's just. Right. And, yeah, don't get me wrong. I don't promote hazing at all. I don't think that any group should be hazing anybody. I mean, here at BNY, we don't haze. We don't haze anybody, new newcomers coming in. We don't, we don't do anything like that because we don't, <laughs> we don't, you know, we don't. We're just not like that. Our philosophy here is just, you know, we embrace people that come in. We want more people to come in. We're not going to say, oh, well, in order to get in, you got to do this and do this. And then you're a part of the group. Congratulations. It's just like, you know, just go through your hours. Take your test. Welcome to the group. Yep. Yep. And uh, OK, so um, kind of carrying it back to sports. Mm-hmm. Um, what kind of changes do you think should be made to like better like the situations that um like the media brings up like well i think more needs to be done with restrictions and policies than you know if something comes up because in the nfl what the nfl is doing is that they've had a couple of domestic disputes where ray rice uh ended up beating his wife in in an elevator knocking Mm -hmm. her out and then dragging her out of the elevator by her hair um and there's been other ones greg hardy was an example he he get a, got in a domestic dispute with his wife, and um, he got released by the, the Carolina Panthers. Uh, in hockey, Slava Voinov he had a dispute with his wife. He, he hit her and really, really did some damage, and he's been suspended since. He hasn't even been reinstated in the NHL. He's still wow. suspended. Um, and then recently with the NASCAR, Kurt Busch, he got into an altercation with his girlfriend or wife or something like that. He just got suspended, and now he's reinstated racing again. But it seems almost too much that it's brought out to, like, a committee 
where it's like you know here here's the hearing this is what this is what happened um any like you know what why did you do this what were your thoughts you know do you regret this and what do you do and then they make a decision based off what you say and i understand humans we're all human we all make mistakes it's our nature but the nfl what they're doing is they're installing a a suspension guideline for for domestic dis- domestic violence um where the first com- uh, where the first violation i believe is uh six games and then the second one you're banned for life from the nfl mm-hmm. which i think i think that needs to be more more um developed in every in every sports league because yeah. This is what needs to happen is if you really want to cut back on this issue, you need to set guidelines. You need to set parameters. First offense is maybe like three games and you have to do a counseling session with somebody. A second offense is a season long suspension, no pay and, you know, maybe another another one. The third one, you're banned for life. That's that's simple plan is simple as that. Three strikes you're out. Yeah, three strikes you're out. That's that's the way I see it. That's the way that it should be. Um, but all too often you get players, they just, they do that kind of stuff and then they walk easy Mm -hmm. and that's what gives a lot of sports leagues and a lot of sports athletes such bad reps is that, you know, one player represents the whole league. So if one player does something wrong, most of the time for people that don't follow the league or people that are just not in involved in sports, um, they might get that general sense of like, well, all athletes are like that. It's not, it's, it's like, no, because not everybody is like that. We're all human again. It's like every human is different. And for athletes, some athletes could be really nice, generous people. I'm around a lot of hockey athletes. I have talked to hockey people. I've talked to athletes in, in hockey. Some guys, they, they're in their own little world. They think that they're, you know, whatever. And then other guys, they're, they're very down to earth. They're very nice. They're respectable. They, they'll take the time out to, to answer a few questions. They'll take the time to sign autographs or something like that. Mm -hmm. So every athlete is different, but you know, in this world, whatever one athlete does something really bad, most of the time, the people who are not heavily involved in the sport or in an organization is going to just generalize the whole group as just bad people. So, yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah, it's, it's, it's a shame, but you know, I think that leagues need to set parameters, set guidelines, set uh, restrictions, yeah. and you know, be more heavily enforcive with these penalties. Yeah, and don't just say you're going to do it and then right let it fly. Right, exactly. Yeah, exactly. All right. Um, do you have any like last thoughts on this? No, subject, no. I mean, you know, I think that this is an this this whole week that we've brought out here at BNY is for a great cause. I think people need to be more aware of domestic violence, um, not only in in families but you know just in general because so it's just there's a lot of things that going on in this world that are that are violent domestic issues, and it's not more aware. Like we're not all that aware of these situations, yeah. and again in sports. Things are being more brought about because of changing times. Yeah. Back then, you know, you can hit your wife and you could just say, you know, that's that's just our family. But nowadays, it's like if you hit your wife, then your wife could press charges and everything like that. And that's it's just a, a sign of the times. It's yeah. a sign of the times. And I think that sports teams are finally catching up with those times, which which it needs to happen, though. Yeah, no, agreed. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. Thank you for coming on and talking. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for thank you for having me. Thank you to Jessica. Thank you, Kayla. I I appreciate you having me on and and making some time for me. Yeah, no problem. Uh, All right. So I'm going to get back to the music here. Um, That was Brayton Wilson talking about sports and domestic violence and just domestic violence in general. Um, Here we have. Gregory White, um, getting back into the uh, interview mojo. Uh, <laughs> so, um, Gregory, you want to tell us a little bit about what you do? Sure. I'm Gregory White. I'm the director of the Domestic Violence Program for Men at Catholic Charities here in Buffalo. 
Um, I've been with the agency for 30 some years, um, originally doing anti-poverty work and then um, because of what I was kind of experiencing in doing that work, um, needed to, to figure out to understand domestic violence a little bit more and as part of that work, um, Catholic Charities was asked to start a program for men who were coming before the criminal and civil justice system mm. um, in 1988, which is when, in fact, we started the program. And as part of my work assignment in 1988, helped uh, start that program. And then in 1992, um, became the director of that program. Um, was a state director, which means there were five of us across the state who worked in conjunction with the New York State Office for the Prevention of Domestic Violence, as well as the New York State Coalition, um, establishing programs like my program um, in five communities across New York State, and have been in that role ever since. That's great. Um, so. Um, you kind of touched on, but like, do you want to go a little more in depth on um, like why the program was started um, by Catholic Charities? Absolutely. Um, at the request of the local domestic violence program, as well as the civil and criminal justice system um, in Erie County, we were asked to start a program that was specifically designed to accept court-mandated men into a program. At that time, I think, and this would be 1992, the program was like 16 weeks long. Um, over the years, we've made the program longer. Now it's 26 weeks or 52 weeks, depending on how long the criminal justice system mandates men to the program. So it mm -hmm. could be a six-month order or a one-year order. Um, and it was, so it was a, a program that would respond um, and report men's compliance with their order to attend the program mm -hmm. um, with the criminal justice system at that time. Um, over the years, we've then expanded that program to all of the eight counties of western New York. Um, and it was really um, with the goal in mind of helping men stop their abuse of their partners. Mm -hmm. um, the goal is much different now, but that's where we were at that time in 1992. Okay. Um, now, um, since you said it was different, like what, how, how has it changed? Like what's different about it now? Great question. Um, when better programs were started, not only in our community, but really across the United States of America, it was really the goal of getting men to stop being abusive of their partners. Mm -hmm. The first batterer programs in this country were started in the late 70s. Um, in New York State here, the first batterer program was started mm -hmm. by a colleague of mine outside of the city of New York um, in 1978. And we all had that goal of stopping, getting men to stop being abusive of their partners. We figured if we taught men some skills, um, address some of their other issues, um, mm -hmm. that that would be a way of achieve, achieving that goal. Over the years, we really learned that that's not at all why men were abusing their partners. And what we did learn was that it was about power and control, specifically in the mid-90s, we learned that, that men misused the power and privilege they were afforded by the culture that we lived in at yeah. the time. So um, one of the really important things um, that was said by a great advocate out of the University of Iowa from the late Susan Schechter was that if men were really out of control and couldn't manage their anger, then why are they only doing this at home? Why are they not doing this to the police officer that comes to their home and arrests them? Right. Or why are they not out of control when they stand in front of the judge who orders them to probation or jail or a batterer program? Yeah. So it was pretty clear that men could, in fact, do control their um, anger, um, can even use anger as a tactic um, to control their partners, which, in fact, they do do. So uh, when we learned about the issues of power and control, um, that was a significant evolution for the program that I'm the director of. Mm -hmm. 
Um, then going a little bit further, we've learned that men really are afforded in our culture um, privilege and power in a way that's not afforded to women mm -hmm. simply because of the gender difference. So um, men use or misuse that power and privilege yeah. against their intimate female partners. Um, and that's what men's abuse is really about. Um, in a culture that still continues to give men power and privilege by simply saying simple things that we don't think anything of, mm -hmm. well, you know, he's the king of his castle, or, you know, boys will be boys, or um, those kinds of innocent things that we all say, mm -hmm. um, but behind it is what continues to perpetuate men's abuse of their partners because it um, empowers them around having that privilege. Right. Um, so that's what we address more so in our program, and it's not rehabilitative now in the way that some batterer programs still are mm -hmm. and have been since the beginning of batterer program time. Um, we are now um, coming at this work from an accountability perspective, and what that means is we believe men can stop their abuse when they want to. Mm -hmm. And we also learned that they don't need to attend a batterer program or get some kind of rehabilitation or treatment to do that. They do that every single day of the week. Mm -hmm. um, so what's the point then of a New York model batterer program? For us, it's about holding men accountable in conjunction with the criminal and civil justice system. Um, so when men come before that system, and um, based on the level of the offense that they have committed, mm. um, could be sent to a batterer program as a sanction or imposition for that offense. Um, more serious offenses hopefully will be sent to either jail or probation, um, but based on that level of the court deems batterer program is um, warranted we would accept the court's referral. And he would be mandated to attend and complete the program if at any point he doesn't comply with that order to attending the program or comply with the, the, the minimal requirements that it takes to attend our program. We would then notify the court or the mandating source that he was not compliant and the court would then reliably impose an additional sanction. So between the program and the criminal justice system or civil justice system, we have held him accountable for what he came before the justice system for. Mm -hmm. um, so that's an accountability mechanism that the criminal justice system can use um, to hold him accountable. Mm -hmm. um, now, has, have you found that to be like, like a successful method in like the past however 26 years or yeah. so that's a really important question because batterer program efficacy is a huge huge issue in the united states as well as other countries that have batterer programs as well um there and that is the discourse around batterer program work in this country um many programs will say um, and we did, at one point, too, believe that we were helping men stopping abusive of their partners mm -hmm. by doing treatment-like things. And that's what we have learned over time through the research that's gone on around batterer programs is that batterer programs are not achieving the goal of getting men to stop being abusive of their partners. And like I said before, in fact, men don't need to go to a better program to not be abusive of their partners. Yeah. They need to just not be abusive of their partners and make that decision. Yeah. And that's why we moved away from doing that and run an accountability perspective, yeah. which is doable. So we know from when a man gets ordered to our program mm -hmm. from a court, whether that be family, court, criminal court, a domestic violence court, could be child protective services, that if he's not compliant with that mandate, 
we know that the mandating source will impose another sanction mm -hmm. to his noncompliance, and that we can achieve. Okay. Um, and uh, so there's a question, uh, how do men get sent to the program? So it, they would get like mandated from whatever court system, like they go through, right? Exactly. Okay. So the judge would, based on the level of the seriousness of the crime that he committed, could decide to send him to a program, um, the Catholic Charities Domestic Violence Program for Men. Mm -hmm. And over a six month period or one year period, that judge can monitor his compliance with attending the program and his compliance with the order that he has issued. <laughs> and if at any point he doesn't comply with that, the judge and court can respond to um, his lack of following that mandate. Okay. So between us and the court, we've held him accountable for that offense. Okay. Um, <clears throat> men are enrolled into 26 to 52 <clears throat> weeks and attend weekly for one and a half hours. Um, what, what information and like materials offered to the men? This is kind of going back a little bit. Yeah. One of the um, a focus group, and it may have been um, in the city of Duluth or someplace, um, men who went to um, batterer programs were given information about domestic violence. And one of the things that was significant, if it's not a treatment program and doesn't mm -hmm. batterer programs aren't fixing men, then what's the point? And victims of domestic violence told us that we felt better about a man going to a batterer program because it was about domestic violence and that was the act that they committed against mm -hmm. me. So at least it's relevant. So um, if treatment doesn't work with men, getting them to stop their abuse, then what do you do when you've got them for 26 weeks or 52 weeks in a batterer program? And what we do is teach them absolutely every single thing, state-of-the-art information on domestic violence, from what is domestic violence, what are we doing about it in our community, how do you stop domestic violence, um, uh, what is power and control, all of those things. Mm -hmm. um, about domestic violence. So it's relevant as to why they're sitting there. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um. So it's taught by two facilitators who are trained in the area of domestic violence. Um, so there's conversation about domestic violence. There's um, material and information that the um, co-facilitators present. Um, there's discussion, there are some movies, snippets um, that are shown for discussion, all of those kinds of things. Okay. Um, so domestic violence is a huge problem across the U.S. and other countries. Um, what, what's what been like done to stop the problem and like what are some of the stats on men's abuse of women in this country? Sure. One of the, um, this kind of stepping back in time when better a program started in this country, mm -hmm. it was kind of intuitively thought that they would be the solution to this problem. Um, some advocates were saying now we're helping um, victims of domestic violence seek shelter and get relief through that kind of protection. We need to address the real problem, and that is men who are committing the acts of domestic violence against victims. Mm -hmm. and. Um, again, like I said earlier, we, were lear we learned that batterer programs weren't necessarily stopping men's abuse of their partner. Mm -hmm. So what is the solution? It really is going to be about um, doing social change work to address a really huge problem. Like one in four women are victims of domestic violence. Um, in the statistics are that 12, 12 million people are affected each year. Um, um, one in six women and one in 19 men in the U.S. have experienced stalking at some point in their life. 
almost 300,000 domestic violence and sexual assault hotline calls were received in the year of 2013. Um, New York State courts issued 300,000 orders of protection um, in 2013. Um, and that's even knowing that domestic violence is one of the most seriously underreported crimes in this country. And we're only talking about statistics from the United States of America, yeah. where every country across the globe experiences domestic violence. Mm -hmm. So we have a huge epidemic problem across the globe when it comes to uh, doing domestic violence work. Mm -hmm. So if you think of batterer programs and that um, at one point it was thought that they could be the solution, if you look at the number of cases and then look at the number of men who are coming into batterer programs, it's only a little segment of that population that has come before a mandating agent. So whether that's courts or child protection services, um, that's not going to stop the program, especially when you consider what we've already just said mm -hmm. about the number of cases that aren't reported to the criminal justice system to respond in that way. Mm -hmm. So there's got to be some other solution to ending domestic violence. And it's really what domestic violence advocates across this country have been doing for years mm -hmm. and what we're doing right here today on this radio station okay. is raising the awareness to the problem of men's violence against women mm -hmm. and that um, that in fact will be the solution. It's like what we did about um, drunk driving mm -hmm. that over the years, recent years, the drunk driving is no longer a funny matter mm -hmm. or anything at all to joke about. It's about what we've done about child abuse and raising the awareness to that. It's one what we've done about smoking that 20 years ago, you and I, if we smoked, could sit here and smoke. And mm -hmm. now we could never do that because not, it's not allowed in public buildings. Mm -hmm. At my agency alone, you cannot smoke on the property of Catholic Charities. Those have all been social change issues that have occurred in our lifetime. Mm -hmm. Well, in my lifetime. <laughs> <laughs> but we have not yet done that for men's violence against an intimate female partner. Yeah. So if I went into the park and beat somebody up, um, a woman who was a stranger, I'm going to jail. Mm -hmm. But if I went home and beat up my intimate female partner, I'm not necessarily going to jail because so oftentimes men's violence towards women gets trivialized in a way that is not trivialized with other serious crimes and offenses. Mm -hmm. That's what we have yet to achieve when it comes to men's violence against women in this country and in this community. Mm -hmm. And that's why I so appreciate um, what you're doing here today, making this a public matter here on campus sure. at Buffalo State College. Of course. Um, and just to kind of like touch on it, like what, how does, because like we've had, um, two women come in from Catholic Charities to talk about like the women's perspective of it yes. and so um like what's it what's it like to be on like the the male side like like talking to like the abusers as opposed to like the victims like um I'm not sure exactly what you're asking oh, me um, but like, um like what's it what's it like to work with the men who who are coming to the program yes yeah um Men who come to the program, um, we might intuitively think that they're um, really horrible, horrible, angry yeah. men, that they're dangerous, and that our lives would be at risk working with them. When in fact, the men who come to our program are just like any other man you would meet out in the community. Mm -hmm. The men who come to our program could be our brothers, could be our fathers, could be our neighbors, could be our doctors, mm -hmm. could be our lawyers, could be um, teachers, mm -hmm. child protective workers, anybody at all. They're not a unique segment of society. Right. Um, 
that are the horrible monsters, when in fact, the men who come to our program come and are respectful, are polite, um, are easy to talk to. Um, oftentimes, men who come to the program will um, find excuses for um, why they did what they did. Mm -hmm. um, so that's so often why we don't even ask them what they did, because men will often not necessarily um, tell us exactly the truth. Mm -hmm. They'll tell us what they want us to know. And um, if that's not exactly um, what occurred, then what's the point? Right. So um, the men who come to us are just like every other man um, in our community. There isn't much difference. Um, they're there for a, different, a specific reason because the court or civil um, um, agent of the court has um, ordered them to come to the program. Okay. So that's a very different experience than you would have talking to victims of domestic violence yeah. who could tell you exactly what happened. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, now, I understand that you're a member of the National Council of um, National Organization for Men Against Sexism uh, or NOMA. It was a NOMA. NOMAS. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Um, and uh, a member of the New York State Domestic Violence uh, Fatality Review Team. Yes. As well as the co-director of the National Training Institute on the New York Model for Batterer Program. Right. <laughs> there's my so fault. there's much more to my job than yeah. just do directing a program. It really is about being out in the community, just like you've invited me to do today, yeah. to talk about this issue so that it raises awareness. And um, particularly NOMAS, particularly um, the uh, um, New York Model for Better programs, that work is outside of the office, out in the community, um, bringing light to the work that needs to be done um, if we're going to ever um, end domestic violence. Um, in anyone's lifetime. So it's working in conjunction with better women's advocates um, around um, trying to achieve those goals. Um, so it's not just to run a program, but it's about doing things that address the issue with a goal in mind that hopefully someday we will stop this problem. Right. So that's why being part of NOMAS, <coughs> being part of um, coalition work in our communities like the Erie County Coalition Against Family Violence or as a member of the National Coalition Against Domestic Violence, um, of which I am a member, mm -hmm. um, is with that goal in mind, with that end in mind, mm -hmm. to end the problem of domestic violence. Okay. Um, and is there like a website or anything that, um, like, uh, any of the listeners, um, want to get like more information about the program? Absolutely. It's the um, New York Model for Batterer program. So it's nymbp.org, which talks all about some of what we've talked about today, plus more, and specifics on the New York Model for Batterer programs, which Catholic Charities Domestic Violence Program for Men is. Mm -hmm. um, we are one of three programs across the state that are um, modeled in that way. We are an accountability perspective batterer program. Um, and in fact, since you mentioned it, um, there are two trainings that will go on um, um, across the state that are um, listed on that website. And it is um, the National um, Training Institute on the New York Model for Batterer Programs, and locally that will happen on Monday and Tuesday, May 4th and 5th mm -hmm. um, in Orchard Park, New York. It'll be held at the Orchard Park Presbyterian Church. So if people are interested, um, they could get in touch with me um, in two ways. They can call me. Um, my phone number is area code 716-896-6390, and that is my office phone number or they can email me at the agency, which is gregory.white at ccwny.org. Okay. And they can find out more information about our program as well as more information on the 
National Training Institute. Um, the National Training Institute isn't only for people who want to um, run a batterer program or do work like I do. Mm -hmm. It really can be for people who are interested in domestic violence, people who are working as better women's advocates in um, domestic violence programs. It can be for judges who order the program, order men to our program. It can be for lawyers who may have litigants who um, are attending these programs. Um, anybody at all is absolutely welcome to join us for the Institute because it's not just about running a New York Model Batterer program, but it's about the analysis that underpins um, that program in the way we think about domestic violence. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, so that's all the questions I had. Do you have any last um, words that you want to say? I just want to say thank you so much. Um, I'm really impressed that Buffalo State College and this radio station has um, taken the opportunity to kind of get the word out mm -hmm. to the community about the problem of domestic violence, what we can do about it, what it's like, what is domestic violence. It's really important, um, an important contribution to the mm -hmm. social change efforts that are happening in this community across the state and across this country that need to continue. Um, like I said before, this is what we need to be doing if we're going to end um, this problem of men's violence against women. Mm -hmm. um, so I really wholeheartedly thank you for um, the opportunity to talk here and um, thank you for the work that you're helping happen in this community. Yeah, no problem. Thank you so much for coming on Absolutely. and thank you. talking about it. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Have a great day. You too. Um, all right, guys. Uh, this is 91.3 FM WBNY. Um, just got done talking with Gregory White. He's the um, director of the Catholic Charities Domestic Violence Program for Men. Um, you know, it's just a new perspective to uh, kind of reflect on and, like, you know, really just kind of put it all into perspective. Um, we're going to get back with the music for a little bit, and then uh, we got some more interviews coming up today. Um, we got Yvonne Stevens, um, Joseph, I think it's Chudoba. Correct me if I'm wrong, I'm sorry. Um, but, uh, yeah, we have a, a, new, a new guest with us here. Um, do you want to introduce yourself real quick and tell us a little bit on uh, what you do? Sure. Um, my name is Yvonne Stevens. Uh, I'm a social worker, a domestic violence social worker. I work at the YWCA of Niagara, um, and I'm really happy to be here. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Um, now, first off, um, just to kind of get like um, a background on like your opinion, um, what is your definition of domestic violence? Well, domestic violence is a cycle, a pattern of behaviors uh, in or out of the relationship. It doesn't necessarily have to be a boyfriend or girlfriend. Mm -hmm. um, it's also referred to as intimate partner violence, and it's basically a way to gain power and control over another individual uh, and use that power and control to sort of make a person feel worthless, hopeless, helpless, so that they remain solely dependent on the partner for their sense of worth or value um, uh, in a relationship. Okay. And um, why did you choose to, um, like, work with, in, like, the domestic violence, like, umbrella? Well, uh, social work, so social work can encompass a lot of, of different things, mm -hmm. I believe. I've been doing social work for, wow, eight years now. I wow. feel really old saying <laughs> that. <laughs> and so I've worked with a lot of different populations. I've worked with moms and children, um, homeless individuals, chronically homeless individuals, like people who are uh, sort of out on the street for a year or more. And so when you think of homelessness, you, you think of chronically homeless people or, or the image that's classically conjured up in people's minds. I've worked with sex offenders, um, you, you know, just the, the gamut of the population. So yeah. domestic violence, um, and my work with women and children, working as a domestic violence counselor, which is sort of the natural next step for me, 
Um, so I don't know if it's something I really consciously decided to do so much as I just wanted to explore the ins and outs of working with women and children. And the overwhelming majority of domestic violence victims are, and survivors are women and children. I also work with men, too. Um, many people would be surprised to know there are quite a few male victims. Mm -hmm. And so for the male victims that I work with, probably for every one that I work with, there may be another 10 who aren't ready to admit or talk about being in a domestic violence relationship. That number increases exponentially for people experiencing intimate partner violence in uh, gay relationships or trans mm -hmm. relationships. So uh, I, don't, I don't know that I chose domestic violence work so much as it chose me. Okay. And um, I liked how you touched on the fact that it's not just women and children that deal with it. It's and it's also not just men. straight people either. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Um, do you want, do you have any like um, sort of like stories that you want to like well, talk about a little, just like touch <laughs> on, you don't have to like give the full thing, but just like, you know, like kind of explain like how like similar and different it can be for like a guy yeah going yeah through. totally um so obviously i can't you know talk about any yeah. names or identifying any for information or anything like that so i'll try to keep this as uh, Vague, yeah. stripped <laughs> as possible <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> um I, I was working with a male um victim and and after i've been working with them for a while uh, they really aren't victims anymore if when you take ownership of your own healing process, you mm -hmm. move from a victim to a survivor. Mm -hmm. So I, w I worked with this survivor for some time, maybe 18 months or so. Okay. And he was in a straight relationship with his wife, who uh, unfortunately uh, had some struggles with addiction. Okay. And she used that addiction as part of her manipulation process in getting money out of him and financially abusing him and taking his entire paycheck and not using it for bills or household support or for the children before her habit. Mm -hmm. um, and that quickly snowballed into serial cheating, which is another form of manipulation in domestic violence relationships. And that quickly turned into him being extremely depressed and forlorn and uh, questioning his, his worth and his value as a human being, which we see a lot of domestic violence survivors go through uh, and doubting, you know, whether or not he was really in a domestic violence situation and, and asking me, he literally asked me, you know, like, can men even be in DV relationships? And that's really sad because our society tells men that they aren't allowed to feel, that they aren't allowed to, to have emotions, that mm -hmm. they aren't allowed to be hurt. And I think that dynamic largely contributes to us not wanting to talk about domestic violence, to us just pretending it isn't happening. Uh, and the same goes for women. Women have been socialized to be, you know, sort of quiet and demure and occupying as little space as possible. Um, and so when we talk about being hurt in, in relationships, there's something that's really intimate, um, that's very unladylike. Yeah. As, as silly as that sounds. And society doesn't value women who are unladylike. And so we do a lot of victim blaming um, in domestic violence, particularly in our society. Uh, and if that doesn't fit with your gender role, you being in a domestic violence relationship, which it typically doesn't, then we act like it doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. And so that's more uh, poignant for, for men, I think in particular. In LGBT relationships, it's even worse because um, individuals in those relationships, threatening to be outed is, is a big deal. Um, if you, especially, you know, people wanna take ownership of their own identities and they wanna be able to reveal things about themselves and control perception of themselves and we all have that right to control our perception yeah. of ourselves. Um, and so using, um, sexuality and outing trans individuals, outing gay individuals um, to family members, to workplaces, using that threat is another form of domestic violence that silences a lot of members of those communities who 
may be experiencing domestic violence and don't know where to turn, don't know what questions to ask. So I just, uh, that, that particular, um, that particular case where he asked, you know, are men allowed to be in domestic violence relationships? That was really sort of eye opening to me about how it, it's not just women. It's mm -hmm. largely women because of our societal roles and this is a patriarchal society and so on and so forth. But the men that experience that, that's got to be just, you know, a, an unimaginable experience. Mm -hmm. Um. Now, does working in this field, um, how does it like affect your day to day life? That's a really interesting question. I think in these seven years, I, I think it's the, the plight of every social worker and probably every healthcare worker and probably anyone who cares for other human beings in general as a profession. It's our our real job is to figure out how to be able to live a life outside of work mm -hmm. without being encumbered by the, the horror stories you hear every day, unfortunately. Um, so yeah, it totally affects my day-to-day -day life. Um, probably just like any other social worker, human service worker, healthcare worker, so on and so forth. And so I think latching on to the successes big and small, mm. of the clients that we see succeed is so important in helping to buoy our spirit. It's, it's important to me to help buoy my spirit, you know, to, to keep me moving forward. There may be, you may work with 20 women and only two or three of them may be successful in leaving their relationships, uh, but those other 17 women keep coming back to see you and they depend on you for support and advocacy and advice or just a listening ear. And so to those 17 women, the three women that are successful leaving, it, it's important that those women are successful in leaving to give that worker some, some success stories or some hope to give to the other 17 women who aren't quite ready or who had to go back for whatever reason. Um, so yeah, to answer my, to answer your question, <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm yeah. gonna to chime in here. So I let everybody know, I want everybody to know right now, Yvonne, she was my very first angel. She got me into the safe house. She took me into my group after I officially left. And this was me reaching out to give her thanks publicly that she, like, she helped me be who I am. Well, Jessica, you, <laughs> you did that yourself. I was, you let me witness that. And I say that to you all the time, right? That yeah. You did all the hard work. You did all the hard work. And that's something I, that every single client, I, I don't, I'm just a witness to the transformation. And I'm, I'm, I'm honored that you let me, that you let me see that. Thank you. <laughs> all right. Um, now, I, I kind of have a feeling that this is kind of going to tag into your answer. But um, what's your favorite thing about, like, doing what you do? Witnessing the success. Yeah. Uh, this is a difficult job. Uh, it's a difficult career. For, and I see so many of us social workers just struggling to know, you know, if we're in the right field, if we affect change. Uh, and that, that's hard. It's hard to watch your brothers and sisters who are out there busting their butts every day. We can't cuss, right? Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's hard to, to watch that. So when you see someone make it out, be successful, achieve a goal, it is overwhelming mm -hmm. sometimes. Um, and that's absolutely one of my favorite things. Um, it, it, with Jessica, you know, two years ago, when we were sitting down making goals, <laughs> you said, I'm gonna go to college, and I'm gonna do all these things, I'm gonna have this, and I'm gonna have that, uh, and you did, you did every single thing you set out to do. And there are so often times when you sit down and set goals with clients and some other individual might have told them before, you know, this is unachievable, that's crazy. Why would you think that big? 
Um, I had a lot of people telling me that my head was in the clouds. I needed to think more uh, realistically. Mm -hmm. My dad was one of those people. He was always telling me, you know, why are you in school? You're just going to go in school and you're not going to find a job because people have such a hard time trying to find a job after you get a degree. Just go get a go go get a job. Pay for stuff. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Pay for stuff. (laughs) And now you're I'm sitting here on your radio show. Yeah, while you're a student in college. Well, technically, this is Kayla's radio show. Kayla's, <laughs> Kayla's 24-hour marathon. Yep, I got a. Let's see. Got six hours and 44 minutes left. Who's oh. counting though? Who's counting? Who's counting? No, no one. No one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, and the chocolates. Um, and I. Jessica knows that every <laughs> office I'm in, I keep chocolates in oh. every single office that I have, and it's really important to me. Yeah. Yvonne was so influential that when they started moving her around to other different ways, I was just like, no, no, we have to rally. <laughs> we need to get her back. <laughs> yeah, well. Um, we became rebel girls. <laughs> <laughs> rebel rousers. <laughs> I'm I'm really thankful to 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 bear witness to people's transformation. Though I I don't I don't know that that's something that many other professions get to do. Yeah. Yeah. Jess, do you have any uh, like anything you want to ask her <laughs> before? <laughs> um. Well, first off, we have um, another client of yours says she misses you. I think you know who it is. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> she misses you a lot. I miss her too. <laughs> she misses you. <laughs> um um it's from the outside what were you thinking as I was coming through like cuz I remember my ex got um arrested mm-hmm. and then I came to group that night. Mm-hmm. <laughs> some people are like, "What? You just you, you you just some people didn't understand why I went to the support group. I came from he got arrested. I jumped in the car and we went to support group. <laughs> <laughs> so you really, really needed support that night. Well, I was I was actually going to group before, and then I stopped going those two weeks when I went back to him. Mm-hmm. And I remember people were like, "What's going on? Where did she go?" Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So you're asking me what I was thinking from the outside? Yeah. Probably, I mean, probably what I think about it, any other client of mine's is. Is she okay? You know, I hope she's keeping herself safe. Uh, is there anything I could have done differently? Is is something we ask often. Is there something I could be doing more of to help this person keep herself safe? Is there some information I haven't given her? Is there something I'm not seeing? What's the right combination of magic words that I can say? Do I need to stop talking? <laughs> <laughs> no, I think everything was perfect. That was my sixth round, sixth and final round. Yeah, it, you know, we know we recited this uh, statistic before, but it takes an uh, individual an average of seven times to leave an abusive relationship. And so you think about that, you think about what it takes to leave a relationship even one time. And it's, it's exhausting and mm-hmm. draining financially, spiritually, emotionally, physically. And then you think about a person doing that seven times, you know. It's like you, riding a bike. You jump on the bike and you don't know how to do it, but you just keep doing it. And one of these times you're going to stay on. One of these th- you're going to keep pedaling and one of these times you won't stop. Yeah. I think the biggest part was around, because I met you just maybe somewhere during the fifth time I had just left the fifth time so I think the biggest thing that helped me stay gone the sixth time was having you and 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 having you to come back and talk to and then you just like you paved the way well I couldn't do that without the YWCA's you know just the license they gave me to go out and help women heal you know I don't I, I don't really know if I've ever gotten that with any other position where my boss, um, Mary Britton Taylor, who's awesome, hey Mary, um, was just kind of like, you know, do whatever you need to do to help uh, victims become survivors. W- whatever program you need to do, just do it. You know, whatever uh, resource or service you need to get, go get it. Um, there is never a question of like, well, you know, cost and money it was always just go do that thing I never had to 
ask her if there was an emergency and I'm just like, oh, you know, I, I need to go out and, and do this or be here with this person. I need to go to court to support this person. It's always just go forth. Um, and so having the YWCA to help me develop professionally uh, in the way that we did, uh, the way that they helped me professionally grow was just so important uh, to my development as a as a social worker and as a human being. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I'm convinced, you know, is that license that helped me help you help mm -hmm. yourself. Thank you, Y. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Y. I'm coming up on my three-year survivor anniversary. Congratulations. Almost. Happy birthday. Thank you. <laughs> we should celebrate. Yay. Uh, almost three years ago, though, you were in the YWCA of Niagara's, mm -hmm. and then you moved to Carolyn's house, mm -hmm. and now you're in Tanawanda's. So I, I've, the position originally was always a dual position. So I was always a social worker at both Carolyn's house and the YWCA. Um, and then something happened and I was just exclusively at Carolyn's house for a little while. And, and then we became short staffed and then I, it became a dual position again. So I was doing domestic violence social work for a couple of different sites between Niagara Falls Carolyn's house and the YWCA Lockport. And for those of you who don't know, Carolyn's House is a transitional housing program in Niagara Falls. It's 19 apartments, studio through three bedrooms for homeless women and children. Uh, and they provide just so many resources, it's insane to even think about it. It's fully furnished apartments that operate 100% off of donations, first of all. Um, because so many women leave with absolutely nothing. We uh, There are so many stories of women who just leave sometimes without even shoes, mm -hmm. you know, just their kids and the clothes on their back, and they just get out in the middle of the night. Um, so having that physical support there, an, an actual apartment, you know, that they can go to after shelter um, is, is hugely important and not having to worry about where to get a couch or a kitchen table. Um, and then there are the support services, so GED programming, um, resident support groups, one-to-one uh, -one verbal counseling, uh, career planning services. There's so many other things I'm not thinking of. Child care being provided. Just so many hurdles that women face. And I'm using women because, again, that's, that's the um, population that largely experiences um, domestic violence and it's so much harder once you have children. Right. There's only women in Carolyn's house, no men allowed. No men allowed in Carolyn's house. And Not even when I was moving out, my dad wasn't allowed. He was a man. <laughs> it's a, yep, yep. It's by design too and it's, you know, it's it's kind of a tough policy, uh, but at the same time there's so many women who just aren't, they just aren't there. They just aren't ready, you know, to see men in, in their space. I understood. People yeah. stocking, people working there, everybody's female. Yeah, and it was it was super empowering, and it still mm -hmm. is when I think about it. I love it. Um, and so then there were the services at Lockport YWCA uh, on Cottage Street, um, and so there was transitional housing program. There's the safe house that you talked about, um, which is a 24-hour safe house uh, for women who, like I said, are, are leaving in the middle of the night and they have nothing and they just, you know, need to get out as soon as possible. Um, if they feel unsafe in a domestic violence situation, then we, we have that there for them. Uh, and they can stay up to 30 days and it's a home-like environment. The staff there is amazing. Yes, definitely. Kathy Jackson, uh, the person who runs the safe house at Lockport. Um, she's got YWCA. so much energy. She's got, she's so amazing. She's so amazing. We couldn't um, do this work without her. Um, and then there was um, the canal homes, mm -hmm. w which are scattered site apartments in Lockport. Um, I also did some case management for that along with uh, another social worker. Her name is Marianne. She was equally, equally amazing. She also did some work with you, Jessica. Um, and so now I am currently doing case management and counseling at the YWCA of the Tanawandas, which has been um, recently joined with all of the them. YWCA. Yeah, so it's all going to be all one big YWCA Niagara of the Frontier. Niagara Frontier. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, super special. When does that officially, like, what is the actual merger? I have no idea. Mergers are big, messy, complicated things, so I have 
I have no idea what's going on with that. Because we had Mary Brown Taylor, and she talked about that. We had Jay, Susan, Ben. Yeah, Jay, Jay. I pretty much, like, I reached, <laughs> I reached out, like, anybody that helps me was coming on the show. Yeah, th- this, I just, I love this so much. I was so surprised when I got this um, contact from you. And I'm, this is my first time on a radio show, my <laughs> first time hearing my voice on the radio. So I'm very excited. <laughs> Um, so does the, so the, I know the um, YWCA of Niagara, that has a support, support group. Mm-hmm. Carolyn's House has a support group. Does they the do. Tondawandas? They do have a support group. Yes. Child care? And, and there is child care provided. Oh. Yeah. Uh, so it, the, the YWCA of the Tondawandas does a lot of the same services that all of the other um, Ys provide. Just there's there's only one very, very tiny um, transitional housing program there just because North Tonawanda's makeup is a little different um, than say Niagara Falls or Lockport whereas Niagara Falls experiences a uh, boatload more poverty than um, any other location so you know it's it's tailored towards what the needs of the location are. Did you know Canal Homes Housing Visions is moving to Buffalo and Niagara Falls? I did. I did know that. There's some big changes coming around Carolyn's yeah. house. Yeah. And it's going to provide some very important transitional housing for domestic violence victims in Buffalo. That's amazing. Which is super, super necessary. So hopefully one day we don't need any of these services and society will learn to hold abusers accountable. Uh, And in the meantime, we have these support services to provide education uh, so that men and women and children know that they don't have to accept abuse as a way of living. Um, That is never okay, that no person, you know, deserves to be abused, that there's nothing you've ever done in your life to deserve abuse, no matter who you are or what you think you've done, there's nothing you've ever done to deserve abuse abusive behavior, domestic violence, any of those things, and that there's help out there. When you're ready to leave, there's help. And if you just want to talk about it and you're not so ready to leave yet, there's help without judgment. And that's a big, big deal because so many people think that they can't talk about their abusive relationships until they're ready to leave. Mm -hmm. And you get ready to leave by talking about your abusive relationship. So I don't know. People should, people should know that, that you know, it's okay that you're not ready to leave. And, you know, there are so many reasons why men and women decide not to leave. And none of those reasons are are bad or wrong. Um, And in fact, lots of studies show that leaving a relationship, as you know, um, an abusive relationship can be the most dangerous time in a person's life. It was almost devastating. Yeah. Financially, emotionally, physically, mentally, it can be really, really devastating. And so wanting to avoid that, you know, who who wouldn't want to avoid that? And so you get ready to leave when the consequences of staying outweigh the consequences of leaving. Mm -hmm. And there's, you know, there's help for that. And so no one should ever say, well, why doesn't that person just leave? Everybody says that. Everybody everybody said that with the Ray Rice incident. That's when I came up with vanity violence because I want to find a medium and express it to people about, express the feeling behind mm-hmm. why doesn't she just leave. Express yeah. what she's feeling, express what he's feeling, express what the victim is feeling so that the, everybody can understand that it's not just, I'm staying because blah, blah, blah. Right. It's, it's, it's way more deeper than that. It there is. is. There is a, a personal connection and it's, it's, it's literally like being chained. Mm-hmm. It is. In addition to that, I mean, there's, there are practical reasons for staying too, you know? Um, Financially, what if you're just solely financially dependent on your partner? Yeah, it can take a really long time to squirrel away enough money for something as big as an apartment. That's where the YWCA steps in and helps. Um, there, there can be, you know, there are the emotional reasons, of course, and the, the emotional attachment. Um, it can be for the house. It can be for the kids. It can be because it's just smarter to stay, because it's safer to stay, because every time you try to leave, he stalks you. You know, there can be any number of reasons. And none of those reasons should be judged because because we don't know. We don't know. We should just support and hold abusers accountable. So many people want that perfect 
that that perfect family, the one you grew up and it's in the books and mm-hmm. the white picket fence and the 2.5 kids and the dog and the cat and the the family that stays together. Mm-hmm. But in today's age, like divorce rates are going up and it's okay to be a single parent. Yeah, it's totally okay. You know what's so funny? I was reading something the other day um, that was talking about how the divorce rate was highest in the 70s in America, like the um, three-fourths of all marriage and in divorce or whatever the statistic was, something astronomical is, you know, really scary. And it's just like, well, I don't want to get married because, you know, my divorce, my marriage is short in a divorce. Um, and now the marriage rate is, uh, the divorce rate rather, is going down, but the um, rates of abuse, domestic violence, financial, emotional, domestic violence, phone calls, um, those are all going up. Mm -hmm. So less people are getting married, and the people who are getting married are unfortunately, many of them are experiencing abuse uh, and and violence resulting in in divorce. So that, I thought that was an interesting statistic. It is. Yeah, so. I mean, it's 2015, you know, so hopefully it's 2015 and we're still sitting here talking about domestic violence, domestic violence, intimate violence, dating violence, and why it's, it's bad to judge people who are in those relationships. So hopefully, you know, maybe in another 10 or 15 years, maybe by the time 2030 rolls around and, and our children are adults, then they'll have the conversation or maybe they won't have to have the conversation. You know, that's Maybe the hope. Maybe it'll just fix itself. My Maybe. Mother, my mother says zero tolerance ends the violence. Zero tolerance ends the violence. Zero tolerance for abusers, mm-hmm. perpetrating abuse. That's absolutely right. And knowing that nothing causes abuse except an abuser being violent. Mental health doesn't cause abuse. If you are a violent individual, a mental health diagnosis will make it much more likely that you'll be violent. The same with addiction. You know, drinking and drugs don't cause domestic violence. It just makes it much more likely that you'll be violent Mm -hmm. if um, you you are struggling with addiction. So none of those, nothing causes domestic violence but an abuser abusing. And when those individuals are held accountable and when we have systems in place, addiction system, mental health systems, justice systems that properly address you know, the needs and ills of our society, then maybe, maybe things will change. Yep. Let's get our picket signs. <laughs> <laughs> I just did a, um, a project in my CWP class uh, interpreting the word girl, but G-R-R-R-L. Mm-hmm. Interesting. I, I had a lot of fun with it, and she absolutely loved it. She keeps playing it. She, most of the views on the YouTube are probably from her. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to look it up. What's that video? It's called Girl. Girl, yeah, with a lot girl. of R's. Okay, like Riot Girl, it came around in the nineties. I'm gonna check it out. <laughs> um, so do you have any uh, like last thoughts or anything you want to say before we wrap up? Um, I'm I'm thankful to be here. Thank you for inviting me. You're welcome. I'm I'm amazed at the progress you make every single day. <laughs> I'm so, so, so proud of you. So proud of you. Uh, and hopefully in another 10 or 15 or 20 years, there won't be any need for a position like mine's and there won't be any need for domestic violence organizations. Um, that probably won't be true, but we'll, we can hope and we can keep working towards that. We can keep working towards not needing domestic violence workers by holding everyone accountable and by not judging and loving and supporting. Yeah. Thank you so much for having me. Thank I you really so much for being it. here. Thank yeah. you. Um, all right, guys, that was uh, Yvonne Stevens, um, social worker. Um, she works with domestic violence, you know, victims and stuff, <laughs> women <laughs> and children and men. Um, so this, you're listening to WBNY. Um, we're uh, we're uh, about to get into another interview. Um, I will I will let our interviewee introduce herself. Um,
Are we on the air? Yep, yep. <laughs> okay, hi. This is uh, Sean Chikowski. I'm um, a life and soul coach. Um, I'm the owner, too, and creator of the West Park Life Coaching Center. And I also am um, a Reiki practitioner and a kids yoga instructor. So I am very happy to be on the air today. <laughs> um, it's, uh, my website, too, if you would like to look me up to, is wnylifecoaching.com. All right, cool. Um, now, just to start off, um, mm-hmm. could you define um, domestic violence from your point of view? Okay, well, I'll tell you um, uh, how, as a life coach, um, I can you know help or you know where we can fit in when it comes to domestic violence. And I first want to give you kudos for um, bringing you know this whole event that you're having. Um, I do think a lot of things is awareness and just the fact that you're hosting this and, and bringing the conversation out forward um, is excellent. Um, and life coaching and domestic violence, um, you know, where I see some of or how we can relate or how I've dealt with clients, um, a lot of it is twofold. Um, we do a lot of the proactive and um, trying to help people um, define boundaries, define inner self. Um, And hopefully, you know, by strengthening that, sometimes they can um, identify. Um, Some people don't even realize they're in abusive relationships, whether, you know, a lot of times can be emotional, too. So we do help that, the awareness and strengthening. And in the aftermath, too, I do a lot with the life coaching um, healing Um, as a repeat practitioner. uh, Oh, you know, um, life coaching is a little different than counseling. I definitely want to make that note. we work in conjunction with medical um, and mental health and counselors. Mm-hmm. We, um, a lot of times in my question, we're more the, um, I, I want to say, the, not the spiritual side, but definitely we're more concerned with, um, you know, the, the, the soul, the inner, you know, the inner person in there. So we, we nurture that. We, um, so, yeah, in conjunction. But through some of our practices and modalities, we do help people um, deal with, with domestic violence, the aftermath of that, and helping sometimes, you know, helping them um, as a support system to get through through some of the um, aftermath of it. Okay. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> Sorry. And um, that's okay. Where do you go with that, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, oh, go ahead. Mm-hmm. Um. So, have you yourself ever experienced domestic violence in your lifetime? Um. It whether like firsthand or like, you know, uh, uh, through like a friend or family? Um, what I, uh, actual physical abuse, you know, um, what I see a lot of what I, um, is, uh, emotional abuse, which I don't know if you're touching upon that this week. And I would really like to bring that up because I do think it is kind of a, um, you know, a lot of people who are going through an emotional abuse with relationships sometimes can't, you know, it's not as transparent as physical. So they don't, um, I think it is abusive, and, and what's really I mean, the message I want to send out is it, it is important that um, sometimes when you're enwrapped in a situation, an abusive situation, um, you know your your reality sometimes gets a little bit distorted, um, and you you question. Um, so that's you know a lot of times it's like kind of the outside voice. You know, some people that they um, they don't, uh, you know, we, we help them bring that awareness. Um, we just. Um, had a, a session, a bunch of life coaches talking about emotional abuse, and that sometimes when you're in it, you almost think like you're you're going crazy because you're you're part of it and you know something's wrong. But um, what we teach people and um, is to really listen to their gut, mm-hmm. listen to their intuition. Um, a lot of times when we're in abusive relationships, you know, the abuser sometimes wants to um, um, silence that. And then you lose that 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 inner knowing. So yeah, it's very important. You know, life coaching we definitely um, and a proactive way too. We try to teach that. We try to teach boundary setting so we know when our boundaries are getting violated. And I, I, if you want to endeavor, we can go there a little bit too. Um, you know, trying to teach people how to realize, it, you know, when there are yellow flags. Um, and you know, that's one aspect of life coaching. That's you know, that's kind of our we're, we're the um, you know, we, we, we definitely are trying to foster awareness and um, try to eliminate it, you know, truly or, you know, strengthen, you know, the person that is going to do. Okay. 
Mm-hmm. Um, now, um, like, what are, excuse me, <laughs> what are a few things that you um, try to coach that are specific to domestic violence and um, how can they help? Okay, big, big, big ones, um, two big ones that I'm very passionate about, sense of self, but um, in relation to boundary setting, boundary, boundary, boundary setting. Mm-hmm. And if you let me explain that, um, what I teach people is that, you know, any type of relationship, um, regardless of who or what, you know, there, there is you, there is another person, and there is a space between you and that person. Right. And, um, you know, a lot of people don't like complication or a lot of people don't understand that they, they have a boundary that protects them, okay? Um, and the stronger we get in protecting that boundary, and it is your right to protect that boundary, mm-hmm. is we, um, in, the, um, in conceptualizing that, you know, I have, um, on a lower scale, even if it's, um, you know, domestic or even, you know, I, I do a lot with children, we try to teach them too. You know, if someone is invading your boundary, you know, they've crossed over that space, and then now they're, they're impeding on your boundary. You have every right to keep that boundary up. Yeah. Um, and in doing that, you're protecting your inner self. Um, so we do a lot of trying to teach that, how to um, keep your boundaries strong. And the, the more we do it, the more we become comfortable. And then we, we're aware when they're getting violated. Um, so, yeah, life coaching, that's definitely a pro of what we try to teach. And that, and that can be... I mean, that can be spread all over any type of abusive relationship, whether it's domestic, um, out, you know, outside. So that is a, a big, strong component. Um, the second one, as life coaches, which kind of correlates, and I, I'm almost taking, we, we try to, you know, we're trying to foster, uh, eliminate domestic violence by being proactive, but we really teach people how to get a strong sense of self. Yeah. Um, you know, by your inner power, um, again, a lot of abuse, is um, I'm a life coach. I speak a lot in energy because <laughs> I think it translates. People can understand uh, um, everything in this world is energy. That's what um, Einstein has taught us. Mm-hmm. But if we think of ourselves as energy, an abuser is trying to take your your, your personal energy, your personal power. Um, and you know that's okay, we want strong boundaries. But we, we teach people how to um, nurture that power, how to listen to it, how to listen to their intuition, go with their gut, um, sensing when things are wrong. Um, increasing self-worth, um, self-belief, self-importance, um, and that a lot of times can, you know, we, we, we're trying to hopefully enable those, you know, and, and strengthen the, um, the the person that, that is, um, you know, obviously um, experiencing abuse. Mm-hmm. Right. <clears throat> Excuse me. <laughs> That's okay. Um, now, Jess, do you have any, do you have any questions? Hi, Jess. Hi. <laughs> How are you? I'm good. How are you? I'm well. I'm well. I'm so happy um, you could come on here. Thank you. Thank you. For anybody listening uh, right now, we had Sean on last week for Vantage Point, and then as we were finishing up, um, something came into my head about something that she said, and I realized that it was so in sync with helping victims, and like, so we went into a little bit of detail, and um, what were some of the things that you specifically could help a victim with? Well, um, again, healing. Um, you know, on a life coach, sometimes people, you know, we can talk. There's talk therapy, but um, sometimes in abuse, um, people's souls get, they get nicked. They get, you know, they're, they're injured. Um, so we, um, through Reiki and some other healing um, modalities that we have, we try to, um, you know, soothe that on a natural way, in a comforting way. Um, so that that's one part. That is probably the, um, you know, the reaction to it. We try to, um, you know, uh, help people move forward, um, you know, gain trust again. Um, and, and obviously it's a, a, a safe um, space to share. Um, and life coaching, again, I said we are, we're very different than um, counseling, but sometimes you need to have that safe, um, safe space just to share how you're feeling. Um, you know, a, a partner to, to, to rely on. Um, mm-hmm. You know, in life coaching, we, we, we can care. <laughs> that's what I, I do. You know, I, that's why I chose to go into coaching um, versus counseling. And, I mean, they do care, but, I, you know, I can take that extra step and I can have some of that support where I can get, um, you know, um, really get in there with a the person. So, yeah, we, um, healing is a big one. I would say 
um, you know, again, and then we, you know, the aftermath, how far and what, where they are along, you know, we try to then, you know, again, help them gain their personal power again, because a lot of times that is, um, um, you know, the, I always say we have power, but it, 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 sometimes it's, you know, through abuse, it can be turned down that light a little bit. We try to encourage people to, to um, mm-hmm. you know, again, uh, get hold of um, who they are and, and the sense of well-being. Um, I remembered that you have mentioned so far boundary setting, and I think that boundary setting is a huge step towards a victim becoming a survivor or even somebody becoming never, never even having the chance of becoming a victim because they have the ability to form those boundaries and to set those, those personal rules that people won't disrespect you. How would somebody go into um, just like a couple tips on boundary setting? Boundary setting, yes. Oh, first is the acknowledgement of your personal space. You need to understand your value system, what is important to you. Um, and it, 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 I always I compare it to, um, like, let's pretend you're a house, okay? You can be a house and you can have all your doors and windows open, okay? People can come and go, come and go, okay? And that isn't the ideal situation. You can also have a house that has a giant fence all the way around. It's so big that nobody can get in or out. And that's not necessarily the best situation. With healthy boundaries, what we want to do with a person is create standards and um, boundaries so that, you know, the door can be locked and can be open for someone who rings the door. We teach people, you know, when you open that door, I'm trying to give a visual so it helps, um, you know, I would assume you'd want somebody to, to knock at that door and be respectful so you would open the door. Um, you know, and again, you know, we work with people. I know some people are comfortable in certain ways, but um, that when someone doesn't knock on the door and just barges your door, then we need to know that, you know what, we're going to put up that boundary and protect that boundary because that is, it is my right as a person. That per, it is not my fault. That is that person choosing to invade my boundaries. So, um, again, it's learning and then teaching people to really be able to stand strong in, in that decision, you know, and to be able to, you know, be firm that, that, and, and recognize, you know, I, I do think a lot of this is, is awareness, awareness, um, and, and I do like, and teaching people it's not confrontation. It is, it, it, when we have healthy boundaries, if we're taught at an early age how to set them, you know, it almost, you know, you demand respect and, um, and you can see when the unhealthy people approach, you know, uh, like, like if we're, we're, we don't have, we're never really comfortable, you know, sometimes we're people pleasers and then these people gravitate and come in, you know, but no, we have to set, set healthy, healthy standards. I hope that answers your question. <laughs> yes, it definitely does. Mm-hmm. And I remembered, um, I think it was last, last week's interview, something caught mm-hmm. my, my ears and I can't, you help people dream. Oh, dream building. Okay, dream yep. building. Okay, that's it. Yep, I do. Yep, and that's a program for. Um, that is to, and you know, this can go in the aftermath too of build, rebuilding your life. But you know, everyone has the ability to create a life, and they deserve a life to thrive in. Um, we sometimes think that's not so, and we we live a life by default. Um, so you know, and talking about personal power you have that power, you know, if you're in an abusive relationship and you feel this is, you know, we'll, we'll help you to realize that you can create, you know, it, it, there is a way of creating. And dream building helps people map out blueprints of their dream. Um, some people don't, and you know, if you boil that down, it's really important to know, you know, we try to get to people to know what they want, you know, what kind of feeling in your life you want, because that sometimes helps guide people, you know, get sometimes, and it can help get people um, from point A to point B. Mm-hmm. Um, yep, and, and again, it, it's, a, it's a program that if it resonates with you, um, um, I, a lot of people want to make transformation in their life, and it, it is a, um, a kind of a, a little bit of a um, program to help people. But again, the philosophies are all the same. Mm-hmm. Did you have to take some kind of certification to do dream building, or is it yep. just what you did? Yep. Nope, it's a, it's a certification. I was certified for the Life Mastery Institute. Um, it was based out of California, so I, um, yep, I'm certified um, through that program. Wow. 
Good stuff. <laughs> I'm very, I'm, I'm very much like, like we were saying with the last interview. I, I, people tell me I have my head in the clouds, and it's, I'm planning. I'm, I'm planning out my future, and like right now, I'm working hard, intently making ways, right, and making moves right now to try to make sure that. Um, the five-year plan that I have in my head has a lot mm-hmm. of options, and this 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 event was a big part of that because m- my passion is bringing awareness to domestic violence, and there's so many different ideas that I have, but mostly, um, and I and I keep bringing this up, and I'm but it's just because I'm stressing the idea of vanity violence. I want to be out there, and I want to help those that are in the situation or out of the situation to bring. Um, art into their life um, with whether it be oh, yeah. galleries dancing music there's just I, I love the idea of dream building and people like there I've met people and you ask them where do they see themselves in five years and they have no idea and I'm just not the kind of person I can't not dream <laughs> dreaming gets me through the day <laughs> dreaming and you, you brought up a, some beautiful points that I want to um, expound on first of all dreaming opens possibility in your life and, and I'm very passionate with the children because I don't know where somewhere somehow they, it has gotten dampened. But the imagination um, opens possibility, and when you're open to possibility, you allow things in. You and, and that's where it starts. I think in our last conversation, I said everything in this world starts with a thought. It does. If you can think it, it is possible. Um, the the clothing on your your back that was designed. It was a thought of somebody. They designed it and created it. The more you're open to creativity, which I love the thought that you said bring in um, art, it is so therapeutic and it is so, um, it, it's, it, 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 and it, I'm very passionate in the children because I think it's silenced a lot in the school system, but hopefully there is a rise in it. But it, it is that side of the um, life and the mind that generates and it's hope. Um, and in in so many different aspects of your life, you can apply this. And, and kudos to you because you, you are living proof. You said you had a vision for this. You had a vision of this domestic violence, um, this this series. It, you, and you put a, a, your action forward, and it is reality. I'm on the air with you talking about it right mm-hmm. now. We are we are creating awareness. It happened, but you and you started it with that you know with that possibility and, and um, code it with you as you like. Dreaming is, and it starts there, you know, go into that feeling and that state of um, dreaming. It is pleasant, you know, and and when you're in pleasant, when you relax, when you open that up, you know, you can receive these these great ideas and and hope and inspiration. So, yeah, that's the dream building program is really a neat thing. (laughs) Did you ever, on on the History Channel, I want to say probably like 2012, no, 2013, there was a um, series called The Men Who Built America. Did you ever see that? I have not, no. (laughs) I I found that, like, I'm not... I'm not one that's very keen on history and I like but this this really clung to me and it was all about um Ford and Tesla and all of those men that uh, that, that that like the, it was called the men who built America like all of these men they had individual dreams and the only thing that there was <laughs> the biggest problem for throughout this series was that they all wanted to own the world <laughs> So what okay. each each time they were coming up with a new invention, they were all like taking over power. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, dream building too. Sometimes they they say you know it, it, um, to be inspired too. They, they, there's some tips to, you know to you know it has to have some value. It has to be good for others. <laughs> it has to align for who we are. You know this is when we map out like the right dream for you. Mm-hmm. But um, but yes, I mean uh, history is very important too. I'm glad you brought that up because. Um, it, you know, we are a progression. We do learn, um, and there is an undertone that, that that is carried through generations. But um, yes, it, it all starts with with uh, the the energy of of motion of of feeling. So very interesting. I'm glad you brought that up. Thank you. Um, <laughs> you, know, you know, and again, you know, I, I keep wanting to go back to your theme this week, but you know, it, you know. If, if if and given in the right situation, you know, it is is possible to help people make you know, um, we we use that um, formula to to help people to move forward. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I think, um, and I'm not sure if anybody has related these two topics before, but I consider mm-hmm. it like in the last uh, interview we were talking about in ten fifteen years maybe domestic violence won't be here, and then mm-hmm. later on in the interview she had said that. 
um, maybe that's some, something like maybe that's dreaming too much or maybe, maybe that's not even possible. But then there was a time when slavery was completely okay. And in, sl- in slavery, while that was one specific um, group of people, but um, they enslaved these people and they would beat them in, 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 in a way that it is just like domestic violence. And one day people came together and they said that it's not okay anymore. And I feel like if slavery can be taken out, so can domestic violence. It can. And it's the power of intent. Yeah. <laughs> I am I, I'm right there with you. I know this is, um, and some people uh, who, who aren't used to hearing these kind of things, and I try to um, bring it down so you can understand it, but if you have the intention and you can do it, I told someone, think about it back in just your instant. If I if I told a caveman, okay, that, you know, someday we're going to sit in a chair and fly in the air. Because <laughs> 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 we're not, you know, someone, it happens, you know. Mm-hmm. These things are durable. We're just right now not, cap- you know, we're not forming those thoughts because it's, um, they, what did someone say, if it, it's not a miracle until you learn the um, the technology behind it, and mm-hmm. then it's not. But if this, if you can think it, it can happen. So I agree with you wholeheartedly. We will wipe out domestic violence. I will send that vibration. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, send yep. out um, those vibes. Yeah, it's an awareness. Awareness. Um, I believe that is you know what I like to share. Boundary setting. People even I love you know. I work with many life coaches, and we said we love to get in those schools instead of talking about bullying is teaching them boundary setting. Yes. Right there. I have a it's, program in my head that I've been, like, I don't know how exactly I would even go about trying to bring it through schools, but it's uh, the D.A.R.E. program for domestic violence. Yes, and it's all such a, you know, as a young child, and see it, see the indications, see when, you know, understanding, and I do think it boils down to just like Albert Einstein, is energy. You know, when someone you feel like as if somebody is, invading your energy you know you you have to have an internal strong internal you know um awareness of listening to yourself we've been trained so much um in this generation to look outside ourselves to understand ourselves so it's confusing you know you get these you know i know um I, as i said if you feel like a situation isn't right okay and you have it in inner inner um signals honor it you know honor it honor it honor honor what it, what is right for you Pick up on it. If you think it's a yellow flag, then, you know, take a step back. Get some help if you need to. Or, um, But, yeah, very important um, life skills that, you know, in a proactive approach, if I if I had – I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to dream build here. <laughs> I will do this. I will be in those schools, and I want to teach those kids at an early age. And that's how you stop it. That's that, You know, that's a, a beginning of the end is the awareness and understanding, understanding you, know, um, you know, how to protect yourself from it. Maybe there's and ability. It, maybe there's an ability to merge our ideas to create like an amazing program. You got it. You know, and the other thing too, and, and I reverse that because I know we're talking about the person being abused, but maybe that abuser will stop if they can find their own personal power. You know, if if we could teach these people, you know, you don't have to go and get get your power and your energy from someone else. We're going to teach you. You know, listen, you can find it on your own. Um, you know, we have breathing and self worth. I mean, it, it would just disable the whole situation. That that you know, and and both both ways. You know. Mm-hmm. What are the um? St- what's stress reduction? Stress reduction. We got lots of those. Um, <laughs> I'm I'm very big, very big in um, breathing. I if I had to pick one modality to help people with stress reduction, it is breath. Everyone can do it. Anywhere you can do it. It is the universal thing that connects all of us. Um, we start this life. We start this lifetime by uh, inhalation, and we end it with our last breath. Um, people don't realize, and I, you know, I've been trained through my kids yoga, and um, I'm doing. I'm right now in the process of being a certification for um, uh, meditation. How we can regulate um, heart, heart, um, our heart rate. How to slow down our fight and flight mechanisms. Wow, that right there. Guess what? If I'm an abuser, you know, if I've, I've been taught. To stop those impulses, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, again, um, a person who who high high anxiety, you know, breath. And I there's all different types of breath, and to to, to go inward. Um, people don't don't quiet themselves when we go inward and we, we settle ourselves. We get grounded. Um, we can slow down what's outside of us, 
because we live in quite a fast-paced society. Yes. And it's, <laughs> Even more, it's always moving fast. It is. And, and I, I don't envy the children these days because, you know, when I grew up, I didn't have all the technology. We had the start of it. But fast and furious, it's coming at us. Um, to learn to slow down and understand that we are a human being. <laughs> you know, having, and, and people think that's funny, but I'm like, no, people are very uncomfortable, um, you know, stilling themselves. So the practice of filling through breath, um, you know, I, I'm, I, I truly, I love meditation. I know that's, um, and it doesn't even have to be meditation, just the um, feeling of stillness, um, getting grounded. <laughs> Um, I hate yoga that practice. feeling. Oh, I'm sorry, what's that? I hate that feeling. <laughs> Say it again, I'm sorry. I said I hate that feeling, and it's not. maybe it's not hate. Maybe it's just because it's something I'm not good at. I can't slow myself down. I can't, like, my mind, like, I put this whole event, like, all these interviews I scheduled in two weeks, and it, my mind was go, 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 go. I've had, like, little, so little sleep over the last, like, month working on this, and I'm okay with it because this event worked out but it's mostly because my mind is go 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 <laughs> well you have to honor that too you know like um you want to balance because you don't want to get burned out i tell people you know if, if your tendency i do have someone who has a tendency very active mind um so you find you need to find a way of relaxing yourself um again th- there's all different modalities that you can you know some you know some people if they're um you know, it's your energy level, too. You know, some people go out and chop wood, and that kind of gives them a, a feeling that, you know, it's meditative in a way. They're not meditating, but they're, they're doing the action. Yeah. I feel that yeah. way about dishes. <laughs> there you go. I mean, even cleaning. You know, if you can, you know, get into a meditative state doing something, and what, what, what is really important, though, is acknowledging that you're taking that, that moment to do that to quiet yourself. It's mindfulness. Mm-hmm. mindfulness you know um again too and what i tell people i i have a tendency like you just said to go 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 <laughs> i'm i'm a high energy person too mm-hmm. um but you need to take care of yourself you my need mo- to take care of yourself my mother um, said when i was five when i was running maybe maybe one of those young years when i was running it looked like just on the cartoons like you couldn't see my feet moving because i was just running so fast yes 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 it- well, you know, sometimes when you walk slow, though, you pick up a lot of things in, in between. So it, it may not feel comfortable, but sometimes in the duality of what we usually do, we can see things in a different way. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, so we can have some kind of gratitude and, and, and have a curiosity to, to, to the, to the um, reverse practice, you know. Um, but, yeah, self-care is really big, too. You know, we want to teach at an early age, you know, even if it's just take your time, you know. Yeah, I tell people, it's a simple thing, like just put your hand on your leg and just feel your sensations that you're in a body instead of always being, you know, it sounds like you, you can go, 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 but just remember, you know, you, you it, it, it is my body. It's all, it has to be connected. You know, one, if you overgo on one, make sure you balance it. You know, we want to balance. I don't know. What do you do to relax, Jessica? Um, I mean, it's, it's kind of, I've not really been able to relax much. I was in a car accident in 2011, and my relaxation was writing. And now since my C5 is all screwed up and I have some partial paralysis going on, my hand gets all black and blue when I write. <laughs> oh, dear. Okay. So maybe maybe what I do to relax is dream. I make a, I, I still make a lot of lists to try to figure out what it, where I'm going. And uh, okay. three years ago, I made the list go. I wanted my associates. I wanted, um, then it changed to, I wanted my associates and bachelors, and I wanted vanity violence talked about, and then now um, I got my associates, and next spring, hopefully, I'll have my uh, bachelors, Good and thing. I'm, like, I make goals, but I achieve them, and I do whatever possible, and I need, like, I need that, that self-gratification that, I, that I, I, I achieved what I set out to do. Okay, but remember, too, okay, <laughs> and this is hard, because, um, you, you know, um, it's going, and I tell you, you know, you're having a human experience right now, okay? And you, you just, I know it's a cliche, but some you know, take time to smell the flowers. But you know, if you can just pause, and even if just give gratitude for something, you know, in your life, just so you can pause and just make sure you have time to uh, uh, reflect. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, just a little reflection along the way, so you, you don't get too too. If you feel the process, you're getting really spun up in the process. You know, sometimes you it, it is you need to have that, that meter switch to say, hey, okay, you know, let, just ground yourself. I tell people it can be as simple as 
taking in something like, you know, you enjoy art, just try to take in a beautiful art piece, Mm -hmm. you know, look at it, just have gratitude, just remember, you know, slow down. Um, You know, uh, I have um, in my office a, because we live in the snow all the time, I love the outdoors and nature. (laughs) I have a twig of a birch tree, and I look at it, I pause, I look, I picture myself out in the woods, Mm -hmm. a place that I like. You know, it's just to slow down during the day, just to, to acknowledge that, you know, um, I, I'm here, I'm grateful, and then continue on. I would say that was just a tiny practice, or even two breaths a day. <laughs> it's just, you know, take two mindful breaths. It, it, I, so that's where I tell people to start if they're not used to into slowing down or meditative. I'm like, it, it can be as simple as in through your nose and out through your mouth. Just take a deep breath in through your nose and out through your mouth twice a day. That's good. You just hit the pause button slightly. Yeah, I guess you just, I, I don't, it's it's weird because you say that, and I feel like I do relax, but bringing it into perspective, I, I don't, I definitely don't relax as much as I probably should have. Yeah. Try it. <laughs> Too proud. I'm probably Too proud. borderline burnt out right now, and Kayla's over there like, what? Yeah. She's, Too in, much that, yeah. she's in hour 18, is it hour 18? Yeah. Um, of her 24-hour marathon for domestic violence. Oh, goodness. You, you ladies need to sleep. You need to sleep. Well, she was already <laughs> here for another hour, 10 hours before she actually started her marathon. So she really, she's in like hour 20-something, 30-something. Yeah. But, but keep in mind, you keep that pace. Sometimes we tend to burn out. So we want, yeah. you know, long and steady. Or slow and steady wins the race. My husband always used to tell me, and he does tell me, and I, when I get on the fast track, I remember that because um, it does, uh, you know, you have energy and you have to, you know, Internal energy, if you want to go on high drive, you do have to feed that. I always tell people it's like a gas tank. You have a gas. I'm not too, you know, you, what I'm more concerned about is you, you recognizing that you have gas in there, that you know where to get gas when you need it. If you have a hole in your tank and people are siphoning gas, you need to know that too. Oh, <laughs> but yeah. um, you, you need that, that self-care, so you, um, getting in tune to that, going in and just minding your, your tank because, you know, you can go, 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 but you, know, you don't want to be... Um, run out of gas in the desert <laughs> oh yeah but yes i just don't know we drifted apart but all, all, all life life you know that's what we do as life coaches we um not only um really take a kind of a norm like we try to you know um, normalize as much as possible mm-hmm. give support some people need a belief partner because in this circumstance like you know like say someone comes in wanting to lose weight um if they're going to um lose weight in their surrounding um support system, many times it's not conducive because it, it's the environment that got them. You know, it's hard to to make transitions around the people um, that are close to you because you're changing their reality too. Um, and that's, you know, coaching is really, really good in that. Like if you want, you know, an outside support that, you know, to see things to help you move. Because Like I said, sometimes we do need some um, outside perspectives and what we're living in. Um Stress management, modalities, healing, all that good stuff. You know, it's the human experience, and we're, we're trying to um, support that. Mm-hmm. I'm looking through your website, and I did not realize how many different people you work with at Western New York Life Coaching. Yep, I'm. Um, I have. I do have my, my space, my my own coaching space, and what we do. It is a collaborative association. So I, I, um, I think the people listed, and there's a few more, are very like-minded um, associates. Um, what's really important for me is people really have that, that strong intention of wanting to help people and mm-hmm. serve in, in, a, in a, an integrity base. So, yeah, I, um, the people I collaborate with, um, somebody comes in, like for nutrition, I, I do I personally do not do nutrition. I'd rather, um, you know, refer them to somebody that has a passion for that. And I think, like, you know, I have a, a, a Jennifer Grouse, she's a passionate uh, weight management um, uh, excuse me, weight management coach. Um, yeah, I have uh, Moni Visco, um, a dear friend of mine. Her and I are collaborating on a kids program. Uh, it's going to be called Get Real, which is all about what we're talking about. It's yep. just ironic. We're going to teach kids to really um, understand their self-importance and that they matter. Um, I think, you know, when you still at a young age, in a very early age, that you're a valued human being, that you matter, um, and we strengthen that. And, you know, you, you can hope, you know, run when you can mm-hmm. <laughs> or set that boundary when you can. You know, you, you have that, um, that that confidence to be able to do that. So we're trying to be proactive and teach at a young age. So that's money. She also does a lot with divorce. So, yeah, I, um, what we try to do is, you know, 
I, I try to match people that you can identify with. You know, if you're going through something, then there is, you know, something to be said about, you know, being with someone that you resonate with. Definitely. Mm-hmm. Are all of these same, do they all work somewhere else and they just, like, are they technically partners or are they all in this building? Uh, we all have uh, our own autonomy. So most of them do have their own offices, um, but we, we collaborate for programs and we also, you know, a, a referral system too. Mm-hmm. Oh. Yeah, we do a lot of, out, you know, we, and this is where we the center versus we go back and forth and we've kind of got hung up on a building where we thought the most important thing is really helping people. Um, and a lot of times we found the be- you know, uh, for coaching one-on-one and, and people do come, we have that space, but we've done a lot of um, outreach programs, you know, going, a lot of people are for two at time. A lot of our proactive um, um, programs, we, we try to go to where they are. So I've done a lot of them. Um, I've gone into the schools. I've, I've been guest spoke at the high school teaching. Um, I was actually recently teaching um, seniors, believe it or not, in their happiness. Wow, that's something we don't learn in the schools. Mm-hmm. And, and why I teach that is... Um, you know, being in tune with who you are and what you like and what you don't like at an early age really helps you when you get older. <laughs> you know, we to find a career path that aligns with you or you can be your best version is like a win-win. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, the people, they they do what they think other people think they should be doing. And, you know, I do end up seeing a lot of, um, you know, not crises, but, you know, um, it, where I feel it can be proactive is teaching some good, good um, life skills early on. So I've done that. Um, Girl Scout Troops. There's um, a great program called Empower Girl Buffalo. They are um, camps that try to empower girls, um, teaching them, you know, to look at themselves in a positive way. I've um, collaborated with them. Um, so yeah, we do a lot of work. <laughs> we're, we're still, we're just trying to get out there. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I definitely understood that when I first found you, and then you, you came in to talk. I didn't at, at first. I didn't really understand what it all was and then I I like and now I'm over here like how do I how do I get certified in dream building how do I get <laughs> call me we'll, we'll do it and I said I, I it would be awesome to have a world full of coaches um we um and we know a lot of us too we just talk back and forth we chose to do coaching um you know because I I really feel strongly about this is that you know when I work with someone I I don't want them to think I'm the expert Okay, because I'm not, you know, you are the expert. We want to give you life skills that you know, you know what's best for you. Mm-hmm. you that's like, um, I mean, a, a pro, I've had um, a strong background in sports, and I've been touched by a lot of athletic coaches um, that really taught me at an early age to draw out my strengths, weaknesses, taught me how to be resilient. Um, I was taught how to adapt to adversity. Um and I had that mindset of really wanting the best for that person that's in front of you. So that that's coaching for me. That's why I resonate so much with coaching. Okay. Mm-hmm. Um, what inspired you to want to participate in Week of the Warriors? The awareness. I, I think it is incredible that you're doing this. Um, I think the user or the, 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 the people who have been affected um, – I think it's very important their voice is heard. Um, people's inner voices, uh, those that are snuffed, you know, um, it is just so profound. So to be a part of it, I feel honored. So, and I think you're doing great things. Uh, you are. You're doing great things. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> oh, I, the one question I forgot about it. Um, sure. So as you were saying, you were thinking the abuser can and normally on a regular basis when you're going through this whole process – you hear a lot of the abuser can't the abuser can't change, and then when I'm thinking ten fifteen years from now, when uh, hypothetically if domestic violence wasn't here, um, in my head it was just it's not that domestic violence isn't here it's it's the abuser are all the abusers are always held accountable and the, the yeah. domestic violence doesn't exist anymore because the abusers can't get away with it. And the way that you're explaining it, it sounds like in your head, 10, 15 years from now, domestic violence doesn't exist, not only because they can't get away with it, but because the abusers have changed. I believe in that. And that's what I, I think that would be, you know, if if we learn to, to, you know, someone says you act out of fear and you act out of love. Um, I don't know, you know, I, I do believe in duality. There's good and there's bad. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and, and my stance on that is, and how I look at it, um, you know, sometimes we can't learn what good is unless we have bad to reflect, you know, reflect on it. 
Mm-hmm. However, I do think, yes, I do think there's two two areas to create solutions here, to create, you know, to make transformation is, yeah, you know, um, that is it. You know, what is what looking at the, the underneath problem here and what, you know, the abuser, they do have that tendency, yes, you know, they're, they're, I do think you can um, hopefully try to disenable that, create awareness, and then maybe, you know, stop it so it doesn't get to that form, you know, mm-hmm. uh, awareness, 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 awareness. Mm-hmm. I'm just over here, you, I had a paradigm shift because I never even considered that the abusers, like there was ever a way that the abusers weren't going to stop being abusers. Yeah, yeah. It's 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 the energy, the power that they feed. And, and um, you know, again, think about it. Where, where was that behavior learned? I, you know, again, I'm not saying for, I, I, I do believe there there is hope um, to, to change and to um, manage. I, I don't like control. I like to say the word manage things, you know, um, mm-hmm. help manage, manage, you know, a abuser. Mm-hmm. How would you feel if we had zero tolerance? Well, I zero tolerance for an abuser. I do think there's certain things that are inexcusable. You know, um, if somebody there's inexcusable in that you will not allow it to happen to yourself. Okay, mm-hmm. um, I do believe um, it's, a, it's a good question you asked me because I you, I do think you have to have zero tolerance for abuse. I mean, you, you can't say it's excusable. You know, if you say no, no is no. Mm-hmm. Um, you have to have that firm stance. You know, that's your value. Um, will it ha- may it happen? Possibly. Um, and if it did, you know, that, that draws in other aspects. But, you know, I do think you need to have a zero tolerance policy for it for your, you know, for yeah. your self-worth. For your self-worth. Mm-hmm. Definitely. First, people need self self worth, and then we need to, uh, zero tolerance. Yeah, yeah, it's one and the same. You know, like I, you get to a point, you know, when you have that boundary, and then somebody, you know, again, if somebody's gonna crash your door, you're gonna be like, I'll let you do it this time. No, no, <laughs> you know, no, you know, it's not gonna happen. You know, I, that's my boundary. You know, I think the more we we strengthen that, the more it, it just becomes zero tolerance. You know. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, Kayla, is there anything you want to add? <laughs> she, <No>. she's, <laughs> okay, wind, I, she's winding down winding down you guys are you, you need to get some sleep <laughs> but um thank you for having me on um if anyone i just you know put it out there you know if anyone needs any, any assistance or, or you know want a more conversation we're all reachable at the western Earth life coaching center which is wny life and um myself sean chikowski um would love to hear from anyone if I can help anyone or serve anyone or educate anyone or heal anyone. <laughs> well, thank you so much for coming on. Oh, thank you, Jessica. I appreciate it. Enjoyed it. You too. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Okay, take care. You too. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. All right, guys. Uh, so that was Sean. She, uh... She's a life life and soul coach, right? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Uh so she gave us she gave us some good tips on uh how to manage your yourself in situations. Mhm. So I think I think it's like a good thing to think on for sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm just over here I'm watching her. <laughs> That's the, I think that was the best part of my position cuz I came in 10 to 6 every single day so far. And I come in and I, I help out with uh, greeting and signing people in and making sure people are here and covering covering interviews, um, if finding other people to cover in if there was an availability. And I get to watch that the, the hours dwindle and the energy <laughs> the energy decreases and <laughs> oh, so tired right now. I mean, I I must say that this this Wednesday is probably so far one of the most busy that we've had if Week of the Warriors. Yeah. Day number three, Kayla. Packed. And she's also the most tired. <laughs> the most tired. The most energy has drained from Kayla so far. Yeah, I think we're gonna go get go get some coffee. <laughs> some more coffee. Cause I, I like drank it all. She's downing the espresso double shots and the mm-hmm. frappuccinos and <laughs> es- espr- chocolate-covered espresso beans. All of the above. 
<laughs> yeah. <clears throat> so, uh, gonna get back to the music. We're gonna kick it off with Poison and Wine by the Civil Wars. So, until next interview. <laughs> Tune in in the 5 o'clock hour for the interview if you're not tuned in now. Or listen to the music. WBNY. Sorry about that. That's okay. Yeah, I did it. Um, <laughs> you're smart. So, uh, <laughs> would you guys like to uh, introduce yourselves and just give us a little background on what you guys do? Sure. Uh, my name is Joseph Chidova, and I am a domestic violence victim advocate with the Erie County Sheriff's Office. Um, I'm Erin Millette, and I'm a master's in social work intern for SBI Health Education at the University of Buffalo, and I shadow um, Joe part-time as well, and I'm also a skill builder. All right, cool. Um, <clears throat> so, individually, but um, how would you guys um, describe domestic violence, like in your own words? Go ahead, Erin. <laughs> <laughs> I want a minute to think about it. Um, okay. I will tell you the politically correct <laughs> <laughs> definition that everyone, I'm sure, you know, hears over and over again, especially with the Ray Rice incidents you see on TV, and that is the uh, the imbalance of power and control in a relationship between two people. Mm -hmm. That's as basic as I can get. Okay. <laughs> Then. Yeah, I completely just agree with that. It's just com all about, obviously, the power and control of everything. And I think that the average person actually doesn't, like, they may not know or understand that. Um, and that goes along with sexual assault at all, as well, that it's just completely about the power and control of and the imbalance. Okay. Um, <clears throat> can you tell us about um, your experiences with um, domestic violence? This is for you, Joe. Personally? Yeah, like, oh, um, it, I mean, like, if you haven't dealt with it, like, firsthand, like, maybe something that, like, you've seen with, like, a coworker, a family oh, member, a okay. friend, something like that. Well, I have dealt with it uh, on a personal level. Okay. So I do have that, uh, I guess you can say, going for me <laughs> when I uh, <laughs> can relate to the, the victim. Okay. I do understand. Um, <clears throat> I will say that the worst case uh, so far, knock on wood, that... Um, I have dealt with was not even uh, the physical like a lot of people mm -hmm. they think it's all physical but it mm -hmm. wasn't it was more verbal uh, emotional abuse and financial abuse mm -hmm. and it was a uh, a woman who was married for 40 years and I'll just give you a real brief overview of what happened sure. um, I met her and uh, we went over what we call a safety plan mm -hmm. and uh, when we did the safety plan she then saw that she could trust me, and she, you know, delved right into the 40 years of financial, emotional, and verbal abuse, which was uh, he would come home from work and say, where's my dinner? You know, if it's, you know, 6 o'clock on the dot, my dinner better be on that table. Mm -hmm. Insert expletive here and there, okay? Um, he would then say, do we have everything in the refrigerator that we need? And... She would look and say, no, we're short, let's just say, milk, eggs, and butter, okay? Mm -hmm. And he would know how much it would cost to get those items. He would then give her the exact change, including tax. Wow. So it, let's say it was $10. He would hand her $10.90. He would then walk over to the, um, the garage door leading into the kitchen, pick out the car keys that she could, you know, you can take this vehicle. So every choice was his. She had no choice in anything. He would then grab a pad of paper and a pencil, and I think you know what's coming next, mm -hmm. write down the mileage wow. to the vehicle and, mm -hmm. so, and would ask her, are you going to Wegmans or are you going to Tops? Because each destination had a different mileage to it. Mm -hmm. 40 years of that. And the, and the greatest part of all that was six months later, I, I realized I couldn't, get into all the psychotherapy with her and I referred her out you mm -hmm. know and uh, six months later she called me up the roof of the car was down she was driving when dri you know talking on the phone I was like well you shouldn't be talking on the phone but <laughs> right she goes I'm sorry I go no it's okay man how you doing she's like oh I'm great I said well where are you going she says you know what Joe I don't know and I don't care something that we take so literally and just like oh wow I can get in my car and go anywhere 
Mm -hmm. she took it as such a huge huge victory yeah wow that's wonderful good for her oh absolutely the sheer strength she had to overcome that is really impressive seriously (laughs) thank you (laughs) you're welcome um and um this is also for you, Joe. Um, oh, boy. What is Reboot Camp? <laughs> Reboot Camp. Hey, I get some air time for that. Okay, fantastic. Uh, well, Aaron knows about what I'm doing as well. Uh, You're welcome. Reboot Camp is... <laughs> <laughs> oh, here comes the plug. Reboot <laughs> Reboot Camp is a... Because uh, I'm a veteran mm-hmm. of the Air Force, and uh, I deal in Buffalo Veterans Treatment Court. And one of the... The biggest issues that I see right now facing our veterans coming home is the uh, reintegration issue where they're just not ready. You know, they're dealing with the horrors and traumas overseas. Mm. And then we're asking them to come home, men and women, women more so lately than the men, are coming home and we're asking them, you know what? Go ahead, go back to work. Go back to school or go back into your family life. You know, the whole dynamic is now changed Mm -hmm. because he or she has been gone for so long. Right. And they've seen people die and all the, you know, the trauma that they've seen over there. And um, the, the uh, the reboot camp is to help our veterans who have the PTSD. We're going, we're looking for land right now and we have a couple, you know, nibbles and hopefully it'll come to fruition. But, uh, we want a campground, a rustic campground with cabins where they can go and just relax and just chill and go fishing or, you know, and, and I want to collaborate with other agencies too so that I can, you know, that's important, right, Aaron? Yes, absolutely. Because <laughs> we're not in this alone and, no. and we can't, you know, we always say our saying is at Reboot Camp, leave your ego at the door. Mm-hmm. This, is, this isn't about me. You know, I'm a veteran, but it's not about me. It's about that guy or that woman vet coming home and needing the help. That's exactly it. I'm a survivor, but this isn't about me. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and uh, can you tell us a little bit about your work with the Erie County Sheriff's Department? Sure. I'm a civilian uh, the victim advocate with the sheriff. So if you had a parking ticket and you saw the, <laughs> the symbol on my sweater here, you cannot get out of it. I'm not going <laughs> to help you with that. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of people do ask, though. Uh, <laughs> and I am uh, been, been there now seven years. And I belong to many coalitions, uh, the Erie County Coalition Against Family Violence, Council Against Elder Abuse, and probably about 20 other <laughs> you know, entities and coalitions that I can mention. But uh, we all work together and collaborate with all of these agencies to bring the awareness to domestic violence, which is a huge issue Definitely. in Erie County. A lot of people are, you know, aware of that until we talk to a, you know, a town supervisor and, uh, and they're like, what? Really? In my town? Oh yeah. It happens in your town. It happens in Clarence or Grand mm-hmm. Island or Springville. West it happens Seneca. Like West Seneca. I'll throw away all those shots to, you know, West Seneca. <laughs> there you go. All the <laughs> people on my, Main Street. There you go. That's where I was. West Seneca was? Uh, I was no, I literally live right next to the West Seneca um, police station. Oh, Centennial Park. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Good luck there. <laughs> yeah. So, um, <coughs> Aaron, right? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, so, uh, have you ever experienced domestic violence in your life? Um, yeah. I not me specifically. I wouldn't consider myself actually specifically personally because I was too young. I was about like one or so when my father left but my mom and my brothers experienced a lot of psychological and emotional abuse okay um and uh how do you how do you think that like do, like do you think that might be like why you chose to do social work or was it um independent from that i'm sure that played a part in it because with social work they talk about the person in the environment and how all of your experiences shape who you are so that affects obviously how you've grown so I'm sure it has I think a lot of it is probably like my mom watching her struggle to support her four children on her own Mm -hmm. um, and coming from that and how low her self-esteem was when she was married and before she was married and then after how how much it grew and seeing her and wanting to 
kind of go into a helping field like she is because she's a preschool teacher and being able to do something like that. But working with her when in her classroom, I know I do not want to be a teacher. So, <laughs> but I do, I do love working with families and children and helping them. And I think I just kind of get that from her if okay. that helps. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, uh, why are you interning with her? Um, well, my actual internship, um, my supervisor, who's actually coming in here on Friday, awesome. um, Aaron Miracle, he's oh. going to be talking about Walk a Mile in Her Shoes. Yep. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, he, I didn't know that you guys worked together. Yeah. <laughs> he um, introduced me to Joe, and he wanted to just kind of, because with SBI, I work with sexual assault mostly, um, which I would say I maybe that's where my passion more so was, but it... They're not that they're completely connected, but some of it does interconnect. So he wanted me to see different areas in Western New York that deals with similar cultures and everything. Okay. Um, so I've shadow I've been shadowing Joe for a little bit, but it's definitely any type of field in that area is definitely an interest. Okay. <clears throat> and uh, what do you hope to get out of the internship? Something Joe has asked me several times. <laughs> <laughs> Free um, coffee. <laughs> mostly just, I, my biggest thing is I just want to learn as much as I can because what I don't know yet, I don't know and I can't help with it. And it just, I just want to see as much as I can, experience as much as I can so that things like this, even the smallest things that I pick up along the way can help me in my future. Okay. Um, and uh, you said you went to UB, right? I go to UB, yes. Okay, or, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Still a student. <laughs> um, so, like, what are your aspirations after you graduate with your master's? Um, I really want to be a counselor at the VA. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. That's neat. <laughs> she would be uh, a wonderful addition to their staff because she has, yeah, laugh. She has the uh, ability to do a lot of active listening. Mm -hmm. Especially when I'm in one of my verbal, you know, verbose moments, and, and I have had, you know, one or two <laughs> chai lattes. <laughs> so she has that going for her, which is nice. That's good. That's good. Thank um, you. <laughs> Jess, do you have any additional questions? Um. Oh, I do have a question for Joe. Oh boy. <laughs> Going back to Reboot Camp, are you yeah. focusing specifically on veterans, or is it it's a veterans-only project? Um, you know, I wish I could save everyone, <laughs> but the starfish has has to be a veteran that I'm throwing back in the ocean. Yeah, um, you know that analogy, right? No, we'll, we'll talk. Walking, we'll, we'll talk. Walking? Okay. Are you wa like walking down the ocean? You throw the oceans, the, you throw the starfish back in, so they live. And then one person says, "But there's millions of them. You can't save them all." you saved that one and it made a difference there you go <laughs> there you go so that's that's the one that i'm trying to make a difference with is the veteran population and um because it is near and dear to my heart my son is a veteran and he leaves on monday for afghanistan oh. yeah so is he excited <laughs> to go to Afghanistan. <laughs> i mean <laughs> uh, he has to have a reason that he's going yeah because his boss told him he had to go. <laughs> oh. <laughs> well, how about how about a reason to join? Um, you know, I I never really got the true answer from Ken. That's his name. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, he he, I'd like him to, to. You know, I would like to think that Kenny did it for you know because I did it. But I think he did it. He wanted to go out and prove to everybody, including himself, that you know, hey, look what I'm doing. You know, th this is all me. I didn't have help from anyone. And he also wanted to see the world, which he has mm -hmm. been all over the world. South Korea, Guam, Alaska, Japan, you know, y y you name it. My son's been there, and now he's going to uh, the Middle East. And, you know, prayers are with him, of course. But, mm -hmm. you know, I got all the faith in the world that he'll come back in one piece and be healthy. And mm -hmm. and we'll see what's, you know, what's going on with him after that. But go if I can get back to reboot camp. Mm -hmm. uh, real quick, uh, what I want to say is that if if somebody's listening and you know of, uh, of a veteran who's struggling, and you know it can be any issue, there are so many wonderful places that you can go to right now for help. Don't think that there aren't people out there that want to help or you know available to help. 
the VA hospital is a wonderful place. They can go to a, a, an organization called B Buffalo Veterans uh, Center, the Buffalo Vet Center, which is on Sweet Home Road in Amherst. They are wonderful in doing therapy with the veterans struggling with you know PTSD and other uh, issues. One of the other things that I've noticed is that um, there is a high population of women that are coming back and they're turning into homeless, you know, the homeless couch surfers and, you know, getting evicted and whatnot, and, and they're veterans. So if you know of somebody who's struggling, there are people waiting for you right now that can help you. You know, give us a call. Uh, just, you know, go to uh, the 211 central referral and look up you know what could help you out the veteran one-stop center or whatever and lastly if i can add this real quick is mm -hmm. um with the domestic violence unit with the sheriff's uh department the sheriff's office we have a brand new hotline that just went into effect and that number is 858-7999 again that's 858-7999 you're not alone give us a call advocates are waiting and someone will reach out to you. Thank you. You're welcome. Is there, um, see, in, in my head, um, I've noticed there's a lot the same between veterans and uh, victims. Do you agree? Yes, I do. <laughs> um, and, I, and I know that it was hard for me after I became a survivor to go through PTSD. And when mm -hmm. I'm looking up PTSD online, um, there's a whole lot of people that don't think that victims go through PTSD. They think it's specifically to veterans. Right. But there's a lot of times when, for the victim, they're in the constant war with the abuser. I agree 100%. And people, they may not be witnessing people dying all the time, but they're in a fight for their lives for a long amount of time before they can finally leave. I agree wholeheartedly. There, there are many... Uh, complainants that I met with the victims who they 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 have that look I, I can't explain it do you know what I'm talking about Aaron I think so uh, that certain look where I, I want to share more with you but I'm afraid because mm -hmm. I don't trust yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. and uh, then when we finally get to the crux of the issue it, it usually turns out that they do have this PTSD going on a certain smell you know of you know, will trigger a response in them. There's certain things, like, like veterans will see things and hear, you know, fireworks on the 4th of July will trigger an event for them. Um, with with some of the victims of uh, domestic violence, something on TV could trigger it. Mm -hmm. You know, watching maybe the Ray Rice will trigger a, a response, an emotional response, and then, you know, they go into this dark hole. I think when uh, the first time I realized that I was going through PTSD was when I was I had gone to the safe house and I came down one night and I was talking to the lady that was working there explaining how scared I was and like I couldn't figure out why I was scared because you know I should have been more scared with my abuser than without but that's when it all hit me and it was more like with my abuser I wasn't necessarily feeling anything. I was numb. And then after mm -hmm. I left, yep. I felt all the fear from that entire time, and it all came hitting me. And I was sleeping, and the only way I could sleep was to put the dresser against the door. That's the only way that I felt safe. I don't know. I was just going to say um, before is that I would also add into the category of people who experience PTSD as sexual assault victims as well. Yes. Um, and that what they're going through as well like anything like sm like you were saying like smells feelings like anything similar to what they experience just brings them right back to that moment and it's really painful and hard for them so anything they're experienced like as long as they have a good partner later in life that is mm -hmm. approachable about those issues I think is a really beneficial thing for them and there are so many good therapies you know therapeutic approaches out there that the victim can go to and, and some of yep. some of the approaches that I've heard that are really uh, becoming more pronounced in, in this field is uh, the EMDR it's called eye movement desensitizing reprocessing you know reliving the event but also having a safe place installation mm -hmm. and that takes that takes months to years with you know mm -hmm. depending on how much trauma the victim has gone through and the other one is called emotional freedom tapping the technique where they they use they unblock chakras, I believe it is, and they do tapping, 
and that has been used with some uh, soldiers now down in the southern states with the PTSD issues, and it's 74% effective. Is that like acupuncture? I guess you can say that without the needles. Oh. <laughs> they, you know, they just tap with, their, uh, with your hand in certain areas of your body, and it releases some emotion, I guess. <laughs> I had it done to me, and it, yeah. It Did it work? Some, yeah, it kind of surfaced some things. <laughs> Is it from East, like where, where does that um, come from? Oh, I wish I had the individual here to tell you, but I, I, I kind of went. Oh, I don't want to relive that again. Thank you. Because <laughs> I know acupuncture comes from the east. It's like east, uh, Eastern medicine. I think we're all related with that. You know, whatever uh, treatment it is, the approach, whether it's acupuncture or uh, Reiki or you know, even just psychotherapy. There, I'm sure there's some Eastern philosophy somewhere. You know, like you talk to Confucius for a, an hour and. He, char- he charges you a couple of rubles or whatever. The, the thing is. Where am I going with that? I don't know. Again, chai latte. Too many. So finally, because it sounds like you specialize in Erie County, where are the places that you know of as a um, part of the sheriff's department that help with people in domestic violence of Erie County? Oh boy, uh, there are so many. Uh, one of my favorites is Cornerstone Manor. They will actually take in uh, the the woman. It's it's for women only. And I can't tell you where it is, of course, but it's in Erie County, and it's uh, one of the places that I refer women with children. And they will uh, do everything in their power to help that woman because it's about empowerment mm-hmm. and help her, you know, go out on her own and do the great things like you've done, and, uh, and especially help the children out because the children are are thinking, you know, especially at that young age, this must be normal behavior. So that, you know, we have to, like, kind of rewire the thinking a mm-hmm. little bit. And Cornerstone mm-hmm. Manor is yeah. wonderful in that. Haven House does a great job as well. That's a nice shelter for women. Uh, the only thing I notice is there aren't any shelters for men. Yeah. I was just wondering that when you said it's only women for the other one. Yeah, so I, I, I can only do one project at a time right now. So. <laughs> <laughs> but anybody sure. listening, you know, that wants to start a men's shelter, because there are male victims, trust me. There's probably mm-hmm. grants out there for it, too. Hey, mm-hmm. there you go. There you go, Aaron. There's your <laughs> dissertation when you go for your PhD. <laughs> and something I thought was funny when you uh, you first told me when you first got here about Reboot Camp and mm-hmm. that you ran over it here. Um, it's funny, on my um, Monday interview with Susan Perry, we mm-hmm. were talking about um, her Wild Women Unite event. Okay. And um, another thing that came up, we were also talking about a festival, and I asked you if you knew what Burning Man was. It started this <laughs> huge conversation on Monday because she's just like, I don't want to burn men. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a good thing. <laughs> I know. It was <laughs> it was very positive on her side. Right. Yeah, but I've, I came I've heard of it. I came up with this idea for um, not necessarily a camp that it goes all the time, but like once a summer, inviting um, a bunch of different people from all the just uh, domestic violence. Uh, there would probably be maybe we could do a male camp one a weekend and a female camp another weekend where they would work on like trust techniques and um, essentially like w- in in her analogy it was um, burning granny panties because <laughs> granny. Pa- Granny panties were the things that, all the things that you keep, like, you would burn anything that was related to your abuser or Mm -hmm. uh, your breakup and, like, uh, perform all these these different workshops that help you empower yourself but are more related to meditating and um, self-confidence and things like that. I think that would be a wonderful event. Um, And, you know, if you need any assistance with that, I can set aside one hour a week <laughs> to, uh, you know, to, you know, put you in the right direction. There is something, if I can, you know, add to that real quick. Um, we just found out that we're going to, we received a grant, we being the uh, Tribute Garden. Have you ever heard of the Tribute Garden? No. <laughs> Tribute Garden is a uh, a place, a wonderful place in Tonawanda, New York. Islewview Park. Islewview Park. And what we're building is a uh, memorial wall and also uh, like an architectural structural thing. You know, like you can sit around in some beautiful flowers and trees and shrubs and stuff Mm -hmm. and just reflect on the the survivors and the victims of domestic violence. And you can actually buy bricks that go into the wall and have whatever your personal inscription put on that brick. 
and we just received the grant I found out Monday from uh, Ms. Sari Becker of the uh, she's a commissioner on the office on the status of women and we have enough money now to complete the entire project hopefully by October of this year that's wonderful wow, wow. which is domestic violence awareness month mm -hmm. yes definitely that's when I want to have the first vanity violence production there you go so maybe I should introduce you to Miss Sari Becker and we'll see what we can do yes definitely <laughs> I'm in okay bring the chai latte <laughs> okay. Sure you don't want a cup out? No. Uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so is there anything that either of you wanted to add or plug or um, just a shout out to anybody? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> she is the intern. <laughs> well, I'll go first, okay, Erin? Okay. I'd like to say hello to my wife, if I, if I may. My beautiful wife. Uh, dirty... 30 years as a school teacher in the same classroom out at Akron Elementary. I don't wow. know how she does it, working with those little guys and girls every day. And to the rest of my family, my sister Sue, who uh, is, you know, I'm, I'm really close with, and the rest of my family members, and my mom, who I love dearly. Um, my son, who's about to go to Afghanistan. I, I'm thinking about you, buddy. And my beautiful daughter, Lauren, I can't forget her, uh, who... <laughs> who I just had a wonderful night with uh, last week. We all went out and went to a comedy club and we're having a great time, you know, being father and daughter again. And I just love that very much. It sounds, it sounds inspiring. Yeah. Well, you know. <laughs> I also want to comment on your voice. Your, your voice is so calming and soothing. I'm over here completely relaxed. I'm like, zen. Well, <laughs> again, chai latte. Nice radio <laughs> voice. <laughs> This is my 15 seconds of fame, so I said I might as well sound like somebody. Who do I want to sound like? And I said, well, somebody who's really relaxed. So <laughs> you pre He prepared for the relax. I did. I, I was sitting in my car going, okay, this is all. <laughs> oh, man, if my boss is listening to this, I'm in so much trouble. <laughs> Why? No, no, it's, it's okay. Brian, it's all good. He would get a kick out of it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> And if I may, my uh, the coordinator for our unit, the domestic violence unit, his name is Brian Moore. He's wonderful. He does a great job, and he also does a lot of work on the Seneca Nation uh, reservation. And he's he's got twenty hats that he wears, and we just re rebooted. There is that word again. <laughs> just rebooted our domestic violence unit, and we added a couple of new advocates. Her name is uh, Miranda Shalansky. And she comes to us from the uh, Haven House, and uh, so does her partner, Christine Pellicor. They are doing a really great job, and we are now into all the courts in Erie County, which Good. you can imagine a victim when they need help with orders of protection or what have you, having an advocate just to re you know relax them and say, hey, it's going to be okay. You know, let, let's let's talk this you know talk this through. Um, and I want to add that for Joe specifically when he is in court, he's not only there for his own clients, but he notices when people are around him that um, seem a little stressed or do need someone to talk to. So he does work with everyone that is around there, and I think it's really great for the advocates to be in there in those kind of situations. That's going to cost me a lunch. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay. Yeah, thank you for coming on. Very cool. Thank you, guys. Very cool. Yeah. All right, uh, that was Joe and Aaron um, giving us the, how you say, police, <laughs> sheriff's law department, enforcement. sheriff department <laughs> side of the <laughs> domestic violence. Law enforcement, he said. Law law okay, law, law the law enforcement side. Thank you. <laughs> I'm not very good with my words. I'm running on like. <laughs> We're going with spot coffee after this. <laughs> um, <clears throat> we're going into our. Let me think. Math. Uh, hour 20 of 24. Yeah, I'm really tired. And uh, <laughs> we're uh, we're uh, really coming coming to an end. I'm happy and sad. All right. Um, we just got our uh, next and last interview called in. So uh, do you want to introduce yourself? 
Sure, yeah. Hi, I'm Brandon Williams, director and writer of Scope of Practice. Short film, released on YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, <laughs> on the air right now? Or? Yeah, you are on the air. Oh, okay. Yep. Um, so uh, what what is your area of expertise concerning domestic violence? Um, actually, I have no expertise on it, per se. Um, I've just... I've got, I'm kind of a uh, outward perspective looking in. I've experienced some of it throughout my life. Um, particularly, I've seen a lot of child abuse. A lot of, a lot of my family. I've a few of my sisters, family, and friends have, you know, fallen victim to domestic violence. So I wouldn't say I'm an expert or anything. I'm just somebody who's, you know, your average Joe who's seen it enough to want to step up and say something. Okay. And um, can you tell us about um, scope? Of practice? Yeah, um, where you want to start one particular? <laughs> Just wherever you feel. <laughs> hmm. um, well, there's kind of a series of events that led up to me um, making this film. Um, like I said, I grew up with a lot of it around me. Um, there was a particular event that happened um, a couple of years ago. Um, it was the, uh, the springtime of 2013, I think. I had a really good friend that I kind of looked up to. Mm -hmm. um in the film community actually he um he was a good guy um so i thought um he kind of introduced introduced me to a lot of people and i also made friends with his fiance at the time and um what happened was he he won a lot of people over pretty much because he you know of where he stood in the film community right and what happened was i found out later that he was abusing his fiance um beating her basically from what i heard Mm-hmm. And I didn't know whether or not to believe it because I know that I know that his fiance is difficult to you know deal with sometimes. But I've never there's no justification in putting your hands on a woman whatsoever, especially one you know as delicate and tiny as her. And okay. it's I, it was hard for me to believe because this is a guy that I looked up to at the time, and I didn't understand. Like, it just it totally it disgusted me. And there's so many things I was going through at the time. Also, I found out that my sister was also in an abusive relationship with a guy that I grew close to. I never even knew that. Wow. Um, just growing up with it for so long, I just realized I had enough. And what bothered me the most wasn't necessarily, I mean, it, it's always, I've become kind of immune to it because of, you know, dealing with it my whole life. Mm-hmm. But what bothered me the most about this situation is the fact that nobody cared. Yeah. It, they almost, they took his side actually in regard. And I didn't, it's all because of what he had to offer them, you know, and that, yeah. that's just, it was messed up. And mm. As opposed to, you know, lashing out or doing something stupid in my head at the time, I said, I need to, I need to make a stand for this somehow. And I thought, if anything, you know, I'll make a movie about it. I'm not going to make a documentary. I'm going to make an actual film based on, you know, not based on, but inspired by events in my life mm-hmm. about a guy who is pretty much a no way to everybody who takes a stand against somebody who is basically a tyrant, the most threatening guy you could possibly think of. And that's what I did. And we, we had no budget making this film. It was just, it was kind of thrown together, but it turned out a lot better than a lot of people expected it to. I still think there's a lot of things that could have been better about it. I mean, I wish I mean, nobody's ever 100% with the films that they make, but right. I think for what we had, we did a pretty good job. And somehow, I was shocked actually, because uh, before we, before I even put this on YouTube, mm-hmm. there was, um, we had a screening at um, Buffalo Market Arcade before they closed, and I wanted to see how people reacted to it. And we had a couple of victims there who were completely touched by it. And that I was scared. I didn't know if I was going to get a lot of scrutiny for it or right. people were actually going to like it. And turns out they really it hit home for a lot of them. And I, I had to ask more people because some of them were my friends that I didn't know if they were just, you know, kind of blowing smoke or telling me what I want to hear. Right. And a lot of people, it was really hitting home for it. I was pretty surprised at it. So now it's on YouTube and it's, I just checked before I called actually, it's at 22,000 views right now. Wow. And majority of the people seem to be liking it. And you're going to get some trolls actually on YouTube and they're going to get some people who are pretty strong feeling about it. But right. for the most part, it's actually being pretty well received. And it's at a point right now that if you search scope of practice, which is a pretty broad term, the first thing you'll see is the film. So, <laughs> so that's where I stand right now with it. That's, that's pretty awesome, actually. Yeah. Did I answer your question? Uh, yeah. Yeah, that's okay. it. <laughs> um, and uh, what kind of barriers did you face, like, making this film? Oh, God, I can't even. Uh, we, <laughs> all, all the money that we put into this film was coming out of our own pockets. Um, mm-hmm. The hardest thing for this, other than location scouting, was getting in. Because it, 
the, the story, sorry, I actually never told you the story. Though. It's a <laughs> story of an EMT, because I used to be an EMT at the time, mm-hmm. um, who just got off his FTO time, his training, and his first case is a call to a um, an ex-football player's house whose wife fell down a flight of stairs, you know, as cliche as that sounds, right. um, who turns out she's being abused. And everybody in town knows about this, but nobody does anything because they love the guy. Mm-hmm. So he's conflicted because he has a history of this, but he also loves the guy because he looked up to him. He used to play ball when he was a kid. And he has a really hard choice to face. So it's a lot of it's kind of reflecting my life, obviously. Yeah. Um, and actually, I'm an actor as well. And I was going to play the part of this, but I wanted to have so much control over this film. So I decided I'm going to step back and I'm just going to direct it. And the guy that I am finding, um, Chris Barbas, who's from Batavia, actually played it just the way I wanted. Actually, he brought more to it than I thought he would. Um, I'm kind of trailing there. But um, <laughs> the story is basically his struggle. Um, with what, how he's going to handle it. Is he going to do anything about it? Is he going to sweep it on the rug like everybody else? Or is he going to, you know, mm-hmm. stand up for what he believes in? And the story is he stands up for what he believes in, and, and I won't spoil anything, but some stuff happens, obviously. And um, the main moral of the story isn't to overcome violence with violence, even though like, some of the things that he does you wouldn't necessarily agree with, but the whole idea is to interpret how how could you do something better the whole idea is to do something about it somehow whether or not it's you know politically figuratively you know physically do just don't brush it away you know and mm-hmm. that's what a lot of people do like i, I would say, sometimes i want to say like nobody cares but i know people care you know they'll they'll say something you know they'll put the sticker on their car you know saying no more domestic violence but it's that's all they're really doing they care but how much do you care how far are you willing to go to try to put an end to this Right. And that's, that's what the major problem is. Everybody know, not everybody, I would say. There, <laughs> there's so much awareness on domestic violence now, but st- statistically, one in five households have domestic violence. That's how common it is. And wow. nobody wants to do anything about it. They want to say they care, but how, like I said, how far are you willing to go to put it into it? I mean, does that mean that I don't care just because I made a film and I'm just going to hope that somebody else does something about it? It's, right. It's, I don't know, it's complicated. It's, some people just don't want to get involved. And, is that yeah. is, is scope of practice I'm answering hi I'm Jessica <laughs> hi Jessica is um, scope of practice the last thing you think you'll do with domestic violence or um, I don't know um, I like making films that I like making films that make people think that, make, that inspire people um, people always said I should do documentaries you know if I want to do that but sometimes you you can tell a story, you can relay a message that you want through a narrative as well, and you can, you know, hit people hard the same way without having to do it in that sort of manner. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know if it's going to be the last thing I do regarding domestic violence, but I do know that anything I produce from here on out, I want to have something behind it. I want there to be a meaning. I want it to inspire. I want it to make people think and talk. And so I don't know if it's the last thing I'll do regarding domestic violence, but I do know it's not the last thing I'm going to do to try to, you know, change people's lives and, you know, make them re- reflect upon, you know, some of the ways they think and the ways they act. And I even, I, I wrote this film when I was a lot angrier, too, right? as you can probably tell when you watch the film, but I started thinking now, like, it could, you got to get to the root of the problem. Sometimes you can't just save a victim. You have to figure out why an abuser does the way he does, or he, or even her. Like, there's a, there's a common misconception, too. There are men who are put in domestic violence situations also, and it's not about being physically weak. It's just about your mentality. How far are you willing to go? You know, like when you're in love with somebody, you don't know how to get out of a situation sometimes, and you don't want to. You don't want to. But it's just it's a really deep psychological thing, and there's reasons why nobody's born a serial killer. Nobody's born a you know a wife beater. They're all they, they become that because of the way they grew up and the, what they were raised with. Mm-hmm. And I think if you can just get to the root of that and try to understand, you know, why these things happen. The first, the first step is understanding. The second step is making a difference. And that's basically where I stand right now. I don't have the answers, but I feel like I'm on the right track somehow, and I also feel like I'm getting really deep into this. So if you want to ask another question. To... <laughs> <laughs> Jess, do you have anything? Um, what were your inspirations when you actually made the film? Like, I know you said that you've seen it, but, like, where did the raw energy, like, you said you made it when you were really angry, and you could tell yeah. that there was, like, a raw energy behind the EMT. 
Did and you it just w- come into the conversation? <laughs> there, there was, was a, an... there, there's a situation that happened with a friend of mine um, who was abusing his girlfriend at the time. It was somebody that I looked up to, and I felt like it was the only... Uh, I mean, I could have lashed out, but, but then again, what, what would that do? You know, it would... It would put me in jail. It would make him look better. You know, I thought that if anything, the way to stick it to him was to make a film about it because he's a filmmaker himself. You know, and oh. <laughs> that's basically what I was trying to do. Well, I know when I watched it, I contacted you to tell you how I thought it was absolutely amazing to see a different perspective and to see um, more people standing up against it. And I'm so happy that you came on to talk about it. I appreciate that. <laughs> um. I put the, if anybody would like to watch the short film, I placed the link on the WBNY Week of the Warriors event page. You can Great, go there you. to listen to it. Do you, what, is there anything else you would like to talk about? Do you have any more events coming up that you think people might want to listen to? Um, the only other thing is, um, School of Prejudice is still out there. It's done now, but I'm um, still trying to push it as far as I can. I told you actually that I'm, I actually submitted it to Dr. Phil and Robert McGraw to see if they would actually look at it and see if they wanted to push it a little bit, too, as well. I don't know if they'll ever get back to me. I mean, those are pretty big names, but um, just trying to get as many groups as I could to share. I mean, it's, it's out there now. It's not to benefit me. It's to try to help other people. So um, the only other thing I have going on is um, the, the next film that we're doing. It's actually a feature length film. It's not a short film. It's called Dwelling, and it's it is a paranormal horror, which I know horror is pretty common in Buffalo, but it's paranormal, and there's also... Like I said, I would never produce anything that doesn't have substance substance behind it, and this is a pretty deep message also. And it's it's about um, a woman who puts herself in danger to contact the dead to find out what happened to her mother, and it's about letting go of some things. And mm-hmm. I think it's a pretty powerful story. It's not related to domestic violence, but it's another project you know that you could follow if you're ever interested in anything I'm producing again. And do you have a um, how would people follow uh, what you're doing? Oh, um, I have a Facebook page. I have two Facebook pages, actually. Um, and for Dwelling, we have a Facebook page as well. Um, my Facebook page is facebook.com slash Brandon P. Williams, Brandon with a Y. And the other one is facebook.com slash Bewildered Media. And if you want to look up Dwelling at all, it would be facebook.com slash Dwelling Movie. All right. Um, do you have any, like, last comments or anything? Um, no, other than thank you for allowing me to come on and speak about it. Very welcome. Yeah, no problem. It was. It's really nice to <clears throat> get like a another like perspective onto it, and especially from like sure. the filmmaker's perspective, because it's like <laughs> that's the one we haven't really gotten yet. So uh-huh. it was really nice to get that side into it too. And um, now that it's like posted on the page, hopefully more people will watch it and you know become more aware of like what really goes on. Yeah, let's hope so. Thank you so much. No problem. Thank you. Yep. Have a great day. You too. All right, guys. Um, that was um, Brandon Williams. He uh, he created a short film about domestic violence. It's posted to the page um, for the Week of the Warriors, um, WBNY. So how are you feeling? You ready? Uh, actually, yeah. Hey, I, I, I just want to say thanks, you know? You got a hell of a lot of potential. You're gonna do fine out there. So you're the new Jack they stuck me with, huh? I'm afraid so. You know, you look really familiar. You may have treated me last year. Wait, Phillips, Donnie Phillips. Buffalo was tight end last year. Guilty as charged. So, you fell down some stairs, huh? It looked like a footprint. Like somebody kicked her in the back of the head. Donnie Phillips? I never would have pegged him as a wife beater. Yeah, me neither. How much do you know about Donnie Phillips? I reported it as domestic violence, so I'm pretty sure the police will handle it. Wow, so naive. What are you talking about? It's Donnie Phillips is what I'm talking about. Well, I'll be damned, rookie. You gotta stop meeting like this. If you keep letting this eat away at you, you are only gonna end up helping nobody and hurting yourself. Your job is to treat people and report problems if you see them. Anyone who knows him tends to overlook the fact that he had some serious issues. This is the world you live in, Derek. Now, I know with your background that that's hard to accept. 
but it's not up to you to save this girl. I just can't sit back and let this happen when I know I can do something to help. I would advise you again to rethink who you're talking to. Someone I used to respect. I don't want to see you make a mistake that you're going to regret. decide whether attempting to save this girl is worth the inevitable loss of your career and quite possibly your well-being. I already have. That was the audio to the trailer. Um, you can see it on YouTube. 91.3 FM WBNY Buffalo would like to present Week of the Warriors from 10 p.m. Sunday, March 22nd. We will be having DJs go 24 hours straight for an entire week. That's seven days to help raise awareness against domestic violence. There will be a ton of interviews, including Glorified Thursday, which will be a day full of bands coming in and playing over the air, just like our Glorified rehearsals on the local show, kicking it off Wednesday night at 10 p.m. with Legion Reed and the Sleepy Hahas. Join us for the Week of the Warriors here on 91.3 FM WBNY Buffalo.